Good morning. You want to find your ID badge right there on the little table, and then you can have a seat anywhere where there's books. Good morning. You want to find your ID badge right there on the little table, and then you can have a seat. There we go. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like the audio is coming through. That's good. Okay, those of you who are joining us on YouTube, you can just type something in the chat. Let me know that you're here. Good morning, Melissa. And uh, let me know if you can hear me. Just let me know if you can hear me. Good morning, amazing. Yeah, just let me know if you guys can hear me. Good. Okay, everybody can hear us. All right. So, go to, there we go. All right, so good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good. Are you excited? A little scared? <laughs> First days are always rough because you don't know what to expect. You come in, you're all apprehensive and don't know what, you know, what I'm going to be like. So just relax. I'm not that kind of a teacher. Okay. <laughs> we're going to make this fun, as fun as we can. We're going to learn a lot along the way, but we're going to try to make this as fun as possible for you. Okay. I did all the hard work. Not much for you to do other than stay reasonably awake and practice the skills when we get to that part. Sound good? My name is Patricia. I'm a registered nurse. I'm the one that developed this program. I am the only instructor here. Um, and I've been doing this for about 15 years or so, uh, teaching CNA. We're much bigger than we look in this classroom. We actually um, have a national presence. So the book that I wrote and my videos are being used by schools all over the country. I'm considered a prometric testing expert. So I'm gonna pass on that information to you so you know what to expect on the test and give you the best chances of success along the way. Um, what I have developed in here makes it easy for you to learn because we're going to uh, learn some principles, and then we're going to apply those principles to multiple skills. So think of it like granules, mixing and matching. So if you look on the back wall, you see all those banners back there. That is what you need to learn. And, and I'm going to go through it systematically, one thing at a time. But by the time we're about uh, in week three, you're going to be able to recite all of that without having to memorize it. Okay, I'm going to make it super easy. And um, this is in your book, so you don't have to like take pictures of it or anything. We're going to, I've given you all the tools that you need. You don't have to take notes. I've even done that for you. We're going to make it super easy. But I am going to talk a lot. Like today, I am going to talk nonstop for four hours. It's, it's a lot. And you're probably going to get a little overwhelmed somewhere in there and think, oh, my gosh, there, there's a lot going on here. I, and as you can see, we're live streaming this to YouTube. So after class today, you're going to get an email from me that um, is going to give you a link to this live stream. So you can go back and rewatch it anytime you want to, uh, which will make it a little bit easier for you. But I also have a syllabus that we're going to follow so you can see in the book what lessons we went over. I've tried to, even though it's a lot of material, I've tried to organize it pretty well for you and to give you resources that you can go back to to cover the information again. Good. But along the way, if you start to feel a little iffy, if you feel lost, if I'm going too fast, if you need me to explain something, 
let me know. This is your class. I'm just here to help you. It's your class. So let me know. Don't be one of those shy people that doesn't want to speak up because you're afraid. I have a million different ways that I can explain things. And if you didn't get it the first time, I've got another way I can pre, you know, um, present it to you that you may get a little bit better. But I need to know where you are to be able to accommodate. Sound good? So in this room, um, you'll see, you know, we had the main camera, which is what you see behind me. But I also have different camera views. So when I'm over there working on the bed, you can see the bed from over here, but you'll also see on the screen, a top-down view. So it gives you some different angles to look at. And when I uh, go over to the sink, I also have a sink view as well. So you'll be able to see from where you're at, but if you want more direct view, you can see it uh, through the, the screen as well. And I'll try to remember to change the screens. But if I forget, somebody yell at me. There's, like I said, it's, it's kind of hard to manage all of this tech and teach at the same time. So sometimes I forget a few things. Um, so housekeeping issues real quick. Doors open about 10 minutes before class. If you're an early bird, go get a cup of coffee. It takes me a while to come in and set everything up. Um, we meet here on Mondays and Wednesdays from nine to one for four weeks. So eight class sessions, that's it. A lot of material to cover in that time, um, but we're going to get you through it. You will have some practice that you need to do. The problem is that you don't have any skills yet to practice. So I'm not going to have you practice anything today or Wednesday because you just don't really have a foundation. But starting in the end of week two and into week three, you're going to have a little bit of practice time at the end of each class session. As we go through the class, the practice time gets longer, my talking gets shorter. So by the time we end, you've got a little bit more practice time built in. Now, this is the challenge for me because I'm really good at teaching. I'm really good at motivating. But the problem is that when it comes to practice time, you're not really good at practicing. You'll want to sit over there in your little tables and your little safe spaces and flip through your book or talk amongst yourselves, and that's not going to help you on the test. So when I open the room up for practice, um, you're going to need to kind of find it in yourselves to get that motivation. I used to just pick like you two go over here and demonstrate this skill. But I got a lot of feedback from students. They didn't like being put on the spot. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. Um, so I want to make sure that you understand your role in practicing as well. Um, parking is on either side of the building. If you parked up front on break, I'm going to ask you to move your car to one side of the building or the other. And um, you can eat and drink in this room. There's no problem with that. Bathroom is there. If you need to go to the bathroom, just get up and go. You don't have to ask permission. This is adult ed. Do what you need to do. If you need to accept a phone call, just step outside and accept your phone call. Um, if you, we do have a break. I'm going to break somewhere around 1030-ish. It's not on the dot. It depends on where I'm at in the lecture. But somewhere around 1030-ish, we're going to break. I give you a 15 minute break. And if you're a little bit late coming back, it's not a big deal. I know that sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get to Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's if you're really hungry. <laughs> so if you're a little bit late coming back, that's okay too. All right, so good. Any questions so far? No? I'd like to find out a little bit more about each one of you. If you can tell me your name and what brings you to class, I can help tailor the program a little bit more for you. And it's a small group. So, um, you know, I'm going to be able to get a little bit more personally involved with each one of you. So are you here because you're working in healthcare and you need that certification to advance? Are you here because you want to get into healthcare because it's a recession-proof industry? Are you here because mom kicked you off of her couch and said, go do something, you're driving me nuts? 
So if I know a little bit more about what brings you to the program, I can help you a little bit more individually. So we'll start with you. Um, I did caregiving for two years. So. Okay. Okay. So you've got some experience behind you. Your biggest challenge may be unlearning a few things so that um, we're doing them according to the way the test requires. So welcome. What's your name? Jamie. Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Hi. Okay, so step one. Very good, very good. Um, you're actually easier to teach. A lot of people have a lot of apprehension coming in. It's like, I have no experience. I have no knowledge. I don't know anything. You're actually easier to teach. Blank slates are, are easier for me. Um, those that have some knowledge, a lot of times I have to break down uh, some of your falsely held beliefs before I can get you on the right track. So if you have no experience, it'll be a breeze. So welcome. Hi. My name is Christy. I've been in the restaurant industry for years, but I just want to change it up a little bit. Okay. Believe it or not, a lot of the skills you already have are going to translate very well into healthcare. Um, paying attention to details, being able to read people, anticipating needs, um, time management, all of those things that you learned in restaurant you're going to need in healthcare. So those are really, really good, good skills to bring in. So welcome. Hi. My name is Jamie. Um, I've been in retail. I like to do the same thing. Ready for a change. Okay, very good. Again, you've got some, some skills that you're bringing in that may not look like healthcare at the beginning, but they actually are very important to have. So welcome. Hi. Okay, very good. So step one, well, welcome. Um, this is Lynn. I'm coming out of kind of emerging from vet med for almost 15 years. Um, I'm trying to get into the RM program. So this is kind of just an in between. Okay, very good, very good. So you've got a lot of the clinical knowledge behind you, different patient group. <laughs> a lot of similar medicine. Yes, yes, a lot, lot of similar, a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and believe it or not, I, I love vet med because you really have to have good observation skills because your patients can't tell you what's going on. Like, you know, I mean, they can pull away, they can wince, they can, you know, give you some of those nonverbal cues, but they're not going to tell you, hey, I fell in a hole chasing a rabbit and my leg hurts, right? You've got to, you've got to be able to read their story those skills are super important in healthcare because even though your patient may be able to physically talk, being able to read their story through what they're not saying is just as important. So welcome. Hi. I'm Nopoli and I want to get into healthcare. Very good. Very good. So, fun. so good mix of people. This room only has two temperatures, hot and cold. That's it. <laughs> There's no real in between. So I'm going to turn the heat down just a little bit, but if it starts to get cold in here, let me know and I'll, I'll adjust it, okay? All right, so you've got some uh, books in front of you and some papers, and we're going to go over all of that in detail in just a little bit, but I want to bring your attention to this paper first. Um, because I've got so many resources for you, when I try to explain them all, it can get a little bit confusing, so I wrote down kind of like a Cliff Notes version so you know where to find things. We have two different websites that I'm gonna be directing you to. One of them is what we call our, our free site or our forward facing site. Everything on there is free. And that's where you're gonna find the skills review videos, a practice test, um, a free ebook, things like that. And then we have the course site. Now the course is an online course. You guys all have access to that. You're gonna get an email from me either tonight or tomorrow giving you an invitation into that online course. It's everything that I say in here, but in an interactive manner. So in here, I'm talking, you're listening. 
maybe you're watching, you know, what I'm, I'm showing, but there's not a lot of interactivity um, online. It's going to take all of that and make you do something with it. So like in the skills, you have to choose the right supplies. I have all the supplies on the screen. You have to click the ones that you need. And if you do it wrong, it's going to ask you to do it again. So it's a way of learning the supplies before you practice. The, all of the steps for the skill are there in picture form. You've got to put them in the right order. So you learn the sequence of the steps. And if you do those things before you get up to practice, it makes practice so much easier. Does that make sense? Um, so the online program you're going to get access to, but I need you, this is um, you guys and your emails. I need you to look at this and see, make sure that everything is spelled right and your email is correct. If it is just a uh, sign here, so I know you saw it and everything is good. If you need to correct anything, make your corrections in that box for me. Okay, did you get anybody get the email I sent out last night? Anybody, did you? Okay, all right. Um, and oh, you have a pen, I, I gave you a pen too. I'm going to apologize to you guys now. Normally, I stand through all of this. My knee is not good right now. <laughs> and um, I'm going to have to sit today. I do apologize, but I don't think that I'm going to be able to stay upright all day. All right. So any questions before we get started? No? Okay, you guys are all in the right place for the right reasons. I didn't hear that anybody's looking for fame or fortune because you're not gonna get you there as a CNA. It's probably one of the most underrated jobs out there. It's a fantastic career. There's not too many jobs that when you go home at the end of the day, you might be exhausted. You might've had a bad day. Nothing might've gone right at all, but you can still end the day knowing that you were able to help somebody who needed it. And for that alone, it's a really, really good opportunity. Oh, one other thing, turn your cell phones off. <laughs> I forgot to do mine, sorry. Um, so it's, it, it is a good opportunity. It's also good for advancement. You've got a lot of different career options available to you. Um, and a lot of them you probably don't even know anything about. But once you get into healthcare, especially as a CNA, you can start looking around and making friends and ask, what do you do? How did you get that job? What kind of education did you have to um, consider you know, to get that position? How, do, how would I do that? What, what do you do in a day? You have access to people of all different types of medical careers. There's things like biomedical engineering. It's a pretty cool, you know, if you're good with gadgets, you know, think that uh, machines and things like that are kind of cool. Well, medicine works with a lot of machines and we have to have a whole team of people that keeps up with those and make sure that they're calibrated and working properly. That's a whole field of medicine that they probably didn't tell you anything about in, in high school. If I had to do it all over again and was starting from scratch, I might look at being a dietitian. It's the only job where you can make $60,000 a year telling people how to eat and there's no nights, weekends or hol you know, holidays in there. That's not a bad gig, you know? Um, you might find it interesting to work in radiology, working the, the CAT scan machines or the MRI machines, or maybe ultrasound might pique your interest. But then there's CNA. And there's nothing wrong with being a CNA for your career. But there are opportunities for advancement as well, should you 
decide to go that direction. The general pathway for CNAs is CNA, LPN, and RN. Um, it's very common uh, pathway for advancement. You don't get any credit going into an LPN program because you're a CNA. It doesn't shave any time off or any money off, but it does help you free up some time to learn more difficult things. So if you already know how to make a bed, when everybody else is in learning how to make a bed, you can be studying anatomy and physiology, things that might require a little bit more uh, difficulty. Does that make sense? So it's a good stepping stone, no matter what direction you go in. Um, most of us know kind of what a CNA is, but I, I wanna take just a minute and ask you to sum up what you think a CNA is and what they do before I get into the, the training, okay? So this time I'm gonna start over here. So what is it that, that you think a CNA does or is? Um, I don't know, like when I go to like a nursing home, I feel like they're the ones that like, they can't give the medicine, like someone else gives them, but like they're giving it to the patient or like they're making the beds or like <clears throat> they're bathing them or something. It's not like, that's what I think they do, yeah. Okay, all right, very good. So personal care? Yeah. Helping patients with personal care? Yeah, basically like physical hygiene care, uh, bed care, getting them around, wound care if you have to, feeding. Okay, all right, very good. Yeah, it feels like the same thing, um, maybe like a vital. Okay, all right, so adding in a few higher level skills like vitals. I think it's more preparing them for when the nurse comes, doing the things, the minor things that make the nurse's job easier. Okay, all right. Good, good. Along with the hygiene and all that stuff. Okay, very good. Same thing. Okay. Yeah, I think it just it's just like kind of like caregiving, so it's like they're like the patient that's like the caregiver. Pretty much. Okay, all of that is correct, and it's it. What you gave me was a pretty good way of summing up what they do, but not too many of you touched on what a CNA is, what they are. So we kind of covered what we saw, right? What they do, bathing, dressing, grooming, feeding, uh, you know, assisting the nurse, maybe some vital signs in there. That's all what they do. It's kind of things that we see from the outside looking in. But the CNA themselves, who they are, is somebody who understands that due to illness or injury, a patient can't take care of themselves. There's some aspect of their life that they are no longer able to do independently. And the CNA has the skill level, the desire, and the ethics to be able to help the patients with those tasks. Okay, that's what a CNA is. Now, the CNA is going to use that knowledge to do all the things you talked about. But it's important that you understand that CNAs are more than just what they do. It's the care and compassion they do it with that will make them a CNA. Because in reality, your neighbor can do everything you just said. Right? Don't need to be certified to help feed somebody that lives next door to you. You don't need to be tested to help somebody wash their hands if they can't wash them, their own, right? That none of that requires a CNA. So it goes a little bit deeper than just what we see. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, I'm going to show you a video. We're gonna start out here. You don't need to make notes. I've already taken all the notes for you. If you open up your, your spiral book, the one with the spiral on it, to page 10. These are the notes for the um, video that we're about to watch.
video isn't very long. It's about 15 minutes. And then we're gonna do an activity afterwards. Okay, those of you who are at home tuning in in YouTube world, um, we're gonna put the link for the video in the chat so you can go watch the video on your own. You'll be able to see it on the screen, but it won't come, it won't be a full screen. The care plan and the CNA, why it's always about the care plan. A presentation brought to you by foryourcna.com. Thank you. Thank you for joining For Your CNA's online CNA test prep. We will be preparing you for both the written and skills portion of the exam. This course contains videos, interactive lessons, activities, testing care plans, test registration instructions, practice questions, and much more. This program goes way beyond our skills videos available on YouTube. But in order to pass the test, there is one single principle that you must understand, the importance of the care plan. Without this key, learning the skills is meaningless. You might be able to mimic what I do in the skills later, but chances are you will fail the test because you didn't follow the care plan. So this course will teach you the skills, but you must first learn how those skills need to be done. So come on inside and I'll explain to you how the care plan works and why it is so important to the test. We are sure that you will become great CNAs and you will provide excellent care for our residents. But before you get started, let's review some basics. Does anyone know what the initials CNA stand for? Certified nursing assistant? That's exactly right, April. A nursing assistant is there to assist the nurse. You will be receiving all of your instructions from the nurse and must follow their directions. This will probably include taking vital signs and assisting with personal care tasks. But you may also be asked to assist with other nursing procedures as well. It is important to only do the things that you have been trained to do. If you aren't sure how to do something, ask someone for help. It's okay to not know everything. But please, don't try to do something that you aren't familiar with. It might harm the patient. In this online CNA test prep program, we're going to show you how to do all tested skills. But that is only the beginning of your education. You will learn way more on the job. Because every patient is different and will have a different way that those skills need to be done. And that's where the care plan comes in. As a CNA, you will be expected to assist our patients with many routine tasks. Generally speaking, CNAs help patients with things that they can no longer do for themselves. Things like sleeping, toileting, grooming, bathing, dressing, eating, socializing, and activities. Together, these are called the Activities of Daily Living, or ADLs. These are things that everyone does every day for a healthy life. But not all patients will be able to do these things for themselves because of illness or injury. Sometimes people are too weak to go to the bathroom on their own or feed themselves. And that's where you come in. If a patient needs help with any of these tasks, you will be there to help them. But not all patients will need help with all tasks. This is Henry. Henry had a stroke and has right-sided paralysis. And this is Martha. She had a left hip replacement. This is Bob. He has had a recent leg amputation. And Annie has dementia. And they will all require different care. Some patients will need help brushing their teeth, but others will do that themselves. As a CNA, we will help the patients do the things that they cannot do alone but we will let them continue to do the things for themselves that they can do. How will I know what I'm supposed to do with each patient? 
I'm so glad you asked, Cassie. As the registered nurse caring for these patients, that's my job. When a patient gets admitted to our facility, I will do a head-to-toe assessment. I will review all body systems to evaluate the patient for real problems and potential problems. This is a very long, complicated process, but here's a brief overview of a general assessment. I'm going to look at his neurological status. I'm going to look at his cardiac status and his respiratory system. I will also look at his integumentary system, which is hair, skin, and nails, and his gastrointestinal system. His urinary system is important, as is his musculoskeletal system. And then I will review his endocrine, lymphatic, and reproductive systems. And finally, I will review the doctor's orders for this patient. I will use all of this information to determine the patient's real and potential problems. Here's an example to put it into perspective. Let's say that this patient has just had a right hip replacement. Now we know that she will need to continue her activities of daily living. She still has to eat, drink, go to the bathroom, bathe, groom, and dress. And after my assessment, I know that she did all of those things herself until today. However, she cannot get out of bed for any reason for the next three days. So since we know that she must stay in bed, I have to figure out how to meet all of her ADL needs. The easiest way to evaluate basic needs is using the TEAMS method, toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, and special. As the RN, I'll take all the information I gathered during the assessment to figure out the best way to help her. She can't get out of bed, so I have to figure out the best way to meet her elimination needs, bedpan or catheter. I also know she is at risk for constipation since she's not moving much and she's on pain medication. This is a potential problem. She can feed herself, but the trace must be brought to her in bed. She can't sit all the way up because of surgery but she can't eat lying flat either. She has dentures, so they must be within reach at mealtimes, and they must be cleaned daily. She's able to clean herself as long as the supplies are brought to her, but she can't reach her legs or feet, so she'll need help. She is on total bed rest for three days, and she also needs her dressing changed every day. You can see how the RN uses all the information available to create a plan of care specifically for this patient. This is called a care plan, and it's something that only an RN can do. Of course, this was a simplified version of the care planning process. A real patient's care plan is much more extensive. Every single aspect of her health, condition, and ability level will be evaluated in order to help her. Even the smallest decision can have long-term consequences. The RN will write a detailed care plan for the entire healthcare team to follow and the care plan must be followed exactly. So every patient will have a different care plan? That's correct, Ben. Every care plan will be different because every patient will be different. Even patients that seem alike because they have a similar diagnosis or have had the same surgery may have differences in care. CNAs don't have enough education or experience to know all the differences. So as a CNA, your job is to read and follow the care plan for every individual patient. In fact, you could say that your job is to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. Do you think you can do that? Can you follow directions exactly? I can, Absolutely. sure, yes. Awesome, then you're well on your way to being a great CNA. But helping patients with ADLs isn't all that you will do. You are also there to help the nurses by making observations. The CNAs are the hands and the feet of the patient. If the patient is cold and cannot reach their sweater, you will get it for them. If the patient can't brush their own teeth, then you will do that for them. If the patient can't get up to shower, then you will help them stay clean. You will become their hands and feet to help patients with things that they can't do themselves but you are also the eyes and the ears of the healthcare team. You will report everything you see, hear, smell, or feel to the nurse. This is the most important task that you have as a CNA. If you see redness around a wound, you must report it. If you hear the patient wheezing after walking to the toilet, you must report it. 
If you feel that a patient's skin appears warmer than usual, you must report it. If you notice that a patient is coughing when eating, you must report it. As a CNA, you will be spending much more time with the patient than the nurse does. So you will be in a position to notice a lot more about the patient. The nurse needs this information to make decisions about the patient's care. Reporting these observations gives the nurse another assessment opportunity. That new assessment may even change the tasks you are assigned to perform. This is called the nursing process, and here's how it works. The RN assesses the patient and develops the care plan. This gives you specific tasks to do. While doing those tasks, you notice things. You report those observations to the RN, and the RN performs another assessment to review the changes in the patient. That new assessment prompts changes in the care plan, and this gives the CNA new tasks to do. And the cycle continues around and around as the patient gets better or worse. This is a continuous process until the patient is discharged. I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying the care plan is going to change all the time? Yes, it could, depending on the needs of the patient. Let me give you an example. The care plan told you to make an occupied bed in room 201. As you change the sheets, you notice that the skin on the patient's backside was red and irritated. You notified the nurse, who then reassessed the patient. The nurse decided that the patient needed to be repositioned every two hours around the clock. This was added to the care plan as another task for the CNA. Using this model, we can respond to the needs of the patient quickly as their needs change. But it also works for patients that are getting better too. You've been assisting Mr. Hopkins with transferring out of bed and into a chair after surgery. But you notice he isn't leaning on you any longer. You notify the nurse. The nurse reassesses the patient and decides if the patient can transfer on his own now. The care plan is changed and this task is removed from the care plan since the patient is improving. Doesn't this mean that I'm going to be bothering the nurse all the time? Won't they be annoyed? The nurse should never be annoyed with you for reporting changes in the patient. They are legally liable for every aspect of that patient's care. Since the nurse requires that information to plan the patient's care, they expect to receive updates from you on the changes that you see. But how often you will have to report changes to the nurse will depend on the setting you are working in. Nursing home patients are pretty stable and don't really change all that often. That's pretty common for long-term care facilities like nursing homes and ALFs and even home care. But in other settings like hospitals, rehabilitation centers, and hospice, patients' health can change rapidly. In those settings, nurses and CNAs are going to work closely and constant communication is required. Since CNAs must follow the care plan and are not allowed to alter it, they can't solve problems. The RN is ultimately legally responsible for the care of that patient. If you have information about the patient that you're not giving to the nurse, the patient can suffer. And the nurse is legally liable for that. Remember, you are an assistant. You are there to help. But the nurse is always in charge of the patient. So all changes, regardless of how minor they seem to you, must be reported to the RN. When the patient is stable, you will not have much to report and may go days without talking to the RN. But if you notice something, then it must be reported, even if you don't think it matters. If you aren't reporting observations, the nurse can't rely on you anymore. And if the RN can't rely on you, then you aren't a good assistant to that nurse. You must report to the nurse everything you see, hear, smell, or feel. Be a good assistant and report all changes and observations. This is the most important job you have. So the care plan is developed by the RN, gives the team tasks, CNAs follow the care plan and report changes. Let's recap what we learned today. Can you tell me how a CNA knows what each patient needs? The, the care plan. plan. As a CNA, you follow the care plan, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. Anything unusual that you notice about the patient, you must report it to the nurse. nurse. Great job. For the exam, you will receive a care plan. What should you do? Follow it exactly. 
That's correct. If you don't follow the care plan, you will fail the exam. It's that simple. Now that you understand the care plan, I can show you how the skills will be done for the exam. But remember, you must always read and follow the care plan. That's a big part of the skills exam. Take the brief quiz below to make sure you understand. See you in the next lesson. Can you grab lights for me, please? Make sense? Let's <laughs> in your white book, the spiral book, go to page 12 for me. Now, those of you following along at home on YouTube, um, this is the book you want to get. This one right here, CNA Skills Study Guide. Um, this is what we're going to work out of. All of you guys in the classroom already have this book. Those of you at home need this book. So if you don't have it already, you need to order it um, because that's what we're going to be working with. It's a workbook style, what we're going to be working with. Uh, two questions came up real quick. I want to get to before we do this. Um, Godzilla, the gate belt's going to go back where you found it, wherever it was initially. And Amber, good luck in class next week. You should be fine. Okay. <laughs> I got, we've got 30 on, 36 online. Um, so on page 12 is a care plan activity. I want you to take about five minutes. You're going to read the care plan and answer the question. And we're going to see just how well you paid attention to the pro or to the, um, video we just saw. This should be pretty easy for you, but go ahead and answer the questions on page 12. I'll give you about five minutes. All right, good. Okay, so let's look at number one real quick. You received the display care plan. How far will you walk the patient? What do you guys think? Ten steps. Yeah. Nobody picked um, until the patient gets tired. Don't have the care plan. Okay, very good. So 
it really is that simple, guys. Whatever the care plan says is what we're going to do. It, it's, it, it really is that simple. So if you've got a care plan that tells you to perform hand and nail care on one hand, how many hands are you going to perform hand and nail care on? One. I know it, it, it's deceptively easy, isn't it? <laughs> You're like, okay, where's the catch? This is what fails most people on the state exam because they don't understand the importance of the care plan. The state exam is not there to see how clean you get the hand. That's not what this is about. The state test is there to see, do you understand the care plan? Because when you get out there in clinical world, what we call the real world, right? When you get out there, if you don't understand how important the care plan is, you will start doing things on your own. You will start making decisions. And the problem is that you simply don't have enough information about the patient to make decisions. So they need, the entire test is centered around, do you understand how important the care plan is? Now, if you've got that knowledge, if you understand, okay, the care plan says 10 steps, I'm walking the patient 10 steps. If you've got that, this state exam is going to be super easy for you. Super simple. Because this is nothing more than a recipe. You read the recipe. And you follow the recipe, and your cake is going to come out just fine. Make sense? Everybody good with that? So that is secret number one. For the test, you follow the care plan. What do you think you should do if you can't follow the care plan for some reason, any reason? Whether it's the patient says no, you don't have enough supplies, you don't know how to do that skill, the patient is unstable, whatever the, the reason would be, what would you do if you can't follow the care plan? Yeah, according to the nurse, that's it. So as a CNA, we only have two doors. That's it. Choice of two. You either follow that care plan exactly how it says, or you report it to the nurse. There's no thinking in there. There's no decision making in there. So guys, how hard can the test be? You're not allowed to think. So all of that anxiety you have over the test, just put it away. If you can read the care plan and follow those instructions, or if not, report it to the nurse, you now have all of the information you need to pass the test. I'm gonna show you how to do the skills because that's kind of important. But this right here is the most important part of the class. Good. All right. So let's go down to um, number four real quick. You receive the display care plan. How many repetitions will you perform? Three. Three, why? Care plan says, yep, absolutely. Okay, and let's go down to eight. Eight, our care plan tells us to take the patient's radial pulse. And how long are we going to count that for? One full minute. Now, this is where things get interesting because chances are when you're ready to take the state exam, you're going to go onto YouTube and type in how to take a pulse because you want to watch somebody else do it. You want some review material. You're just trying to brush up. You don't want to forget, you know. So you'll go on YouTube and you'll type in how to take a pulse. And there's going to be thousands of videos there that are going to tell you how to take a pulse. And most of them, they're all right. There's no wrong. They're, they're all right. But most of them are going to tell you to take a pulse for 15 seconds and multiply that by four because pulses are always measured over a minute. So if I tell you somebody has a pulse rate of 45, 
that means her heart beat 45 times in a minute. If I tell you the heart rate was 72, that means their heart beat 72 times in a minute. So pulses are always reported over a minute. But that doesn't mean that we always have a full minute to count. Right? We're busy people. We got lots of patients to take care of. And they all need to be bathed and groomed and toileted and fed and all of those things, right? So we don't always have that kind of time. And in reality, you don't need to count everybody's pulse for a full minute. Because if it's nice and steady and it just thumps along pretty regular, thump, 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 thump uh, you could count for 15 seconds, multiply that by four, and get your full minute read. Perfectly okay. And about three quarters of the videos you're going to see on YouTube is they're going to do just that. They're going to count it for 15 seconds and multiply that by four to get their full minute reading. And there's nothing wrong with that. So what does this care plan tell us to do though? So one, minute. one full minute. And what do we know about the care plan? Follow the care plan. That's right. We're going to follow the care plan exactly. So even though out there in clinical world, we may be able to count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four on the majority of our patients, this care plan is telling us something different. It says to count for that full minute. Do we need to know why? What do you guys think? No. No. We just follow the recipe. So for the test, when you get a care plan that says count for one full minute, you're going to count it for... One full minute. Don't take those shortcuts. But in a clinical setting, if it doesn't specify, if it doesn't say one full minute, then you can count for that 15 seconds and multiply that by four. So we have to look at these care plans as individual patient instructions. Good? Questions so far? So these are individual patient instructions. Anybody have kids? Anybody have more than one? Okay. When you have more than one child, any of, of you that don't have kids, did you have siblings? Are you exactly like your sibling? Exactly? Okay, if you've got more than one child, are all of your children exactly the same? No. So I'm pretty unique. There is nobody exactly like me, and I'm happy about that. I'm good with that. You are also unique. There is no one exactly like you. And that tells us that everybody out there, all of our patients are going to be unique and there is no one exactly like them either. So if you now try to treat somebody just like everybody else, there's gonna be conflicts because they're not like everyone else. They're gonna have their own very specific needs. Does that make sense? It's not up to you to figure out what those are. That's actually the nurse's job. So let's say that we're in a nursing home and this is my patient. This patient just came in. My job is to look at them and do a head-to-toe assessment. I need to find out everything about this person. I mean everything. I'm going to find out how they eat, how they toilet, how they sleep, what their past medical history is, what kind of surgeries they've had. I want to know what their hobbies are. I want to know what their social situation is at home. I want to know um, whether they smoke or drink. So what kind of recreational activities they do. I want to know if he's a hang glider, right? So I need a lot of information about this person. And I'm going to take all of that information and put it together and come up with a plan of how we together as a team are going to take care of his needs. Your job is to read and follow that care plan. And if you can't, let me know. 
So here's the problem, right? I know this guy the best. I've just spent 30 minutes in there dissecting his hobbies and habits and everything else. I know as much as I can know in that short amount of time the most about this patient than anyone else here, right? Now, I've decided that he's going to, because he's trapped in bed right now, because he was a hang glider and had a horrible accident and crushed both of his legs, he can't get up. So I'm going to make a list of all the things that together we're going to make sure we do with him. So if he can't get out of bed, then we're going to have to somehow take care of his toileting needs because those didn't stop. So I'm going to develop a plan for that. Um, he can't get to the dining room. So we're going to have to bring his food trays to him. I know that we need a lot of protein to help with muscle development when you're healing. So I'm going to talk to the dietitian about the diet that I want to um, prescribe or you know, that I want him on. I know that he's probably going to be able to brush his own teeth though. Right. His legs are hurt, but he can't get to the sink to brush his teeth. So that means that we're going to have to bring everything to him and clean up afterwards. Good. Makes sense so far. Okay. So his care plan is going to be completely different than his roommates over there because his roommate can get up and walk. He's got um, atrial fibrillation that is uncontrolled right now. So his heart rate's like all over the place. And he's here for medical management of that, medications and things like that. So two, di two totally different patients, two totally different care plans. Does that make sense? Okay. So the biggest thing, takeaway that I want you to take away from today is that every patient is different. The nurse is responsible for deciding how we're going to treat that patient. And our job is to perform those tasks as directed. That's the biggest thing that you need to remember leaving today. Good. Questions? No? Okay. All right. So, So how many of you guys would like the um, test and care plan? Would, would, would that help you? If, if I could give you the care plans from the state exam, would that help you? No. Okay, why? Because you're going to follow it regardless. So. Okay, so every care plan out there is going to be different, right. and you're going to follow whatever that is. But... Care plan for the test, even though all of them are different. Wouldn't you like like the one from the test that you could like practice before you get there, like do a dress rehearsal, dry run? Yeah. Okay. Do you see these care plans on page twelve? Those are the test and care plans. That, that's it. So if you are asked to ambulate a patient for the state exam. This is what your care plan is going to say. If you are asked to take a pulse on the state exam, this is what your care plan is going to say. Now, that's only four. And we actually learned 20 skills in here. This is just four out of the 20. Um, so it's a good starter set. The rest of them you're going to find in the book. Okay, we're going to go through each one. I'm going to show you how to use this book to prepare for the state exam. These are the care plans from the state test. That's helpful for you to practice, right? But remember, this is just one care plan for one fictional person that doesn't really exist. <laughs> and that every care plan you're going to see out there is going to be a little bit different. Okay. Questions? All right. So if you remember, um, go back here real quick. 
So if you remember our nursing process here, this is important. You do need to know this. The RN assesses the patient. They develop the care plan. We do the tests on the care plan. We report our observations. And then the RN is going to reassess the patient. And this is how care improves or has to accommodate the patient's um, decline. Okay. It's not one of those things that is one and done. Nurses have to reassess the patient every shift. In some cases, every hour, depending on how much the patient is changing. So it's a whole lot of work, right? Head to toe assessment. I'm looking for real problems and potential problems. And I've got to give medications and do treatments and coordinate with other team members and arrange for tests and read lab work, and there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. So if I'm busy doing all of this nursing stuff, this planning of care, evaluating the care, making sure that the um, skills are being done correctly, if I'm doing all of that kind of stuff, and this guy rings the call light and says, hey, I have to pee, it's going to be hard for me to stop what I'm doing and help him go pee. What I need is somebody that knows how to help somebody pee. Who might that be? Yeah. So that's what CNAs do. CNAs are going to help the nurses. It's kind of the whole point of the name, right? Certified nursing. What does the A stand for? Assistant, right? So you're there to help the nurse. The nurse figure out what needs to be done, you're there to help them do that. Because if I'm spending all of my time doing these um, routine, repetitive tasks, then my stuff isn't going to get done. So what I need are helpers. But I need helpers that, that are going to help the way I need help. I don't need helpers that are going to come in and do things all their own way. Because at the end of the day, I'm the one that's still legally responsible for this patient. So let's say that this patient has two crushed legs and you were assigned to help care for them. And you don't really understand the care plan and you don't really care. And you decide it's easier if you get the patient transferred out of bed and onto a bedside commode, one of those portable toilets, like what do we have over there? You know, it's just easier for them to go to the bathroom on a bedside commode and um, easier because you don't have to clean them up and all that. So you make the decision to get them out of bed and onto a bedside commode and something bad happens. The safety is, yeah, he's got two broken legs. He's not weight bearing. This is a bad idea, right? Very bad idea, but you did it anyway. Do you think I want to accept the legal responsibility for that? When I wrote down, patient does not get out of bed, use a bedpan or a urinal. <laughs> but if you go outside that care plan and you make decisions on your own, do you think I want to accept legal responsibility for things you're deciding? Probably not. So as a CNA, you have no liability as long as you're operating under the care plan. Now, when you step outside of that care plan and you start doing things on your own, making decisions, changing things, then you have now accepted liability for what you're doing. Does that make sense? That is not a place you want to be. Not a place you want to be. So as long as you're following the system, RN writes care plan, you read the care plan, you follow it. If you can't follow it, you report it. You're golden. No liability at all. But if you're not inside that care plan, that's when things get difficult. Uh, anybody ever hear of lawyers? Anybody ever hear of lawyers? Yeah. Not nice guys, usually. <laughs> not nice guys. I mean, they're nice if they're working on your behalf. You know. <laughs> 
But if you find yourself across the table from them, <laughs> not nice guys. And they're going to ask you very, very difficult questions like, so what made you think you were qualified to make that determination? What kind of education and experience do you have? What kind of degree do you have that gives you the ability to assess that patient? They're not nice. They'll have you in tears. You don't want that. Most importantly, the patient doesn't want that. Because when you make decisions without understanding the consequences, they're the ones that are going to pay that. Does that make sense? So it's really, really important that we understand our role. Now, there's another part of this, right? We understand that we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. We understand that now. But to further understand our role in this, we have to remember a couple of other things too. One of those is that CNAs do normal. Now, along the way, you're going to have a million what if questions for me. Well, what if the patient wants to get out of bed? What if they refuse the urinal? Well, what if this? What if that? You're going to have a million what if questions. And truthfully, I can't answer those because you're dreaming of a patient that I've never met. I, I don't know. So who would be best to answer those questions? Yeah, the nurse that did the assessment. So when you get out there in the clinical world and you have questions, you need to address those questions to the nurse that has that patient. Because every patient is different. Does that make sense? But the one thing that CNA is having common is that you do normal, which really means that you are going to perform routine tasks on stable patients according to the care plan. So if I have a patient that's not stable, that is not your patient. Okay, does that make sense? Routine tasks on stable patients. Because if somebody is unstable, that actually means that I'm gonna have to think on my feet. I'm gonna have to solve problems as they come up. And remember, CNAs don't. So you're starting to get a sense of your, your role here, right? So CNAs follow the care plan. They work on stable patients. They perform routine tasks. And the tasks that they perform are going to have very, very specific steps, very specific ways that things have to be done. And that's what these banners are. These banners are principles. Principles are going to guide our performance. So if we're going to use supplies, then we need to have a barrier to put those supplies on. If we're going to wash something, some body part, there's some rules we have to follow. We're going to check the water. They're going to check the water. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. There's rules that we have to follow. And I'm going to go over all of those rules with you as we go. Okay? So we're building a house that we are going to safely be in as CNAs. This is our scope of practice. So our scope of practice starts with the care plan, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. We do normal and the principles tell us how to do that. Okay, so right now we're in a pretty safe place. Now above that, we have to remember that it's always about the patient. It's not about us. So we're going to talk to the patient. We're going to explain what we do. We're going to make sure that they look comfortable and are comfortable. We're going to make sure that they're safe as we do these, these skills. And then the very last thing we have to remember is that we're going to report everything to the nurse because we really are their extension. So if I know something, my nurse should know it as well. So if you put all of that together, you see that little house there on the bottom of each banner? It's here on this wall in this banner in a bigger. It's also on the back of your ID badge. If you look on the back of your ID badge. 
if you understand this, this concept, this scope of practice house, we call it the CNA, happy CNA place because it keeps us happy and out of trouble, right? If you understand these five things, that is what a CNA is. When we talked about that earlier, we talked about what a CNA does and what a CNA is. This is your scope of practice. This is what a CNA is. Good. Questions? Okay. So I have now given you almost all of the information you need to pass the CNA state exam. And we're only on hour one. Okay. We're going to learn how to do the skills. I know you guys are probably wrapped up in that. Well, how do I give a bed bath? That's going to be easy. How do I take vitals? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how. But if you don't understand this, the how isn't going to make any sense to you. Okay, good. Okay. So this is our very first banner. It's called Skill Rules. You can see it over there. It's also in your book. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, we're going to perform skills as directed on the care plan. We're going to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and yeah, we're going to observe for any changes, abnormalities, or pain, right? So we're always watching and listening and feeling. And who do we report those observations to? The nurse. Okay, so you've just learned the very first principle. So we've got 10 more to go. But just like I broke this down for you, I'm going to break down each one of those as well. So as we go through the course, this is going to make more sense to you. And we're going to add more as we go today. We're actually learning two more um, principles as we go. But this is going to be repeated. Every skill that we have, every single one follows this. We read the care plan. We do that. If we can't do that, we report to the nurse. If we do the skill and we notice something, we report it to the nurse. So this, um, this explains to us what we do. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the test. So when you go to the state exam, so when you go to the state exam, um, you will all register independently. Now, what that means is um, on the third week, I'm going to give you the registration packet. We're going to fill it out in class. We're going to talk about how to send it in. Um, you need a level two background check. That's step one. Then you'll send in your application, either online or paper. Doesn't matter. Um, and then after you've applied, and they approve you, I'll get into that later, but they approve you for testing and you get your test admission letter. When you get that test admission letter, it's gonna give you the date and the time and location of your test. Our closest testing center <coughs> is down in Tampa. Um, there's one in Ocala too, for those of you that live up in Citrus County area, um, but for us in Hernando County, Tampa is our closest. When you go to the testing center, you have to be there no later than 8.30. If you show up later than 8.30, they can refuse to test you and they don't give refunds. So you need to be there no later than 8.30. The only things that you're allowed to take in with you is your test admission letter, your keys, and two forms of ID. So your phone has to stay in your car. If you get dropped off, you know, let's say you don't drive and somebody has to drop you off. When you take your phone into the testing center, they're actually going to put it in a locker. You will not have access to it. So you can't take any study material in. You can't take any um, anything in that that would help you on the test. You also cannot wear any smart watches. Um, so that may be you know, difficult to be in this room all day long with no, nothing to distract you. It can be a little bit difficult. Now you can have your phone out in your car. Now that's important. 
I'm going to get to that in a minute, but you can't have that phone out in the car. So you go, you're going to be there with seven strangers. You've got all of the information that you need to test, your test submission letter, your keys, and your IDs. And then they're going to bring you into a waiting room and check you in. Now, from this waiting room, there's going to be two additional rooms in your testing center. One of those rooms is for the skills test. Skills tests are private. So the only people in that room when you're testing is one other testing candidate and the two RN evaluators. Here in Florida, we have two people that are going to grade you. So there's four people in the room, you, another testing candidate, and the two RNs. There's also a room that's going to have computers, and that's where you're going to take the written test. The written test is 60 questions, multiple choice, that's done on the computer. You have to pass both tests to be a, a CNA. You have to pass the written and the skills. If you are unsuccessful at one of them, let's say that you pass the written, but you failed the skills. When you go again, you only have to take the portion you failed. So that written test will be good for two years. Okay, okay. You have three attempts and two years to pass both sections. If you don't pass both sections, you either have to wait two years to retest or you have to go through a 120 hour CNA program. Those are kind of hard to find and very expensive. My goal is to get you to pass the first time. So we don't have to worry about that. All right. So when you go to the testing center, um, you're going to, they generally test eight people a day, generally. And two, there's two RN evaluators there to do that. But when you go to the testing center, once they check you in, they're going to, the evaluators are going to disappear for a little while, probably about 15, 20 minutes. And what they're doing is figuring out how to pair you up. It's not random. They don't just point at two people and say, okay, you two are paired up, you two are paired up. It doesn't, it's not random. Now, there's a, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, when you go and get checked in, they're gonna ask you, do you have anything that would prevent you from being a patient for any one of these skills? So let's say you just had your wisdom teeth taken out. You'd want to let them know that because if she has mouth care, I don't want her to do mouth care on you if you've got some fresh stitches because that could be difficult. Um, let's say that you have athlete's foot on one of your feet. Well, if she has foot care, I don't want you to be a patient for her. Good. Makes sense. Okay. So they're going to ask you, do you have any conditions or situations that would keep you from being a patient? for any of the skills. If you do, please speak up. Can we test on each other? Yeah, we're gonna get there, yep, okay. yep. So please speak up if you have any conditions. But once you, um, once they, they figure out who you are and, and what you have and you know whether you're okay, then they're going to um, bundle you up with another person into a group. And like I said, this is not random. Now, with physical skills, like if um, you have transferring from bed to wheelchair, I need to try to pa uh, pair you up with somebody about your size or smaller. So I would probably pair you up with you, okay? Um, I would not, the, the test does not set you up to fail. I'm not going to try to pair you up with some, you know, a six foot tall, 300 pound man for the test. Does that make sense? So they're going to um, look at a lot of different criteria when they decide who your partner is going to be. Now, when, when they pair you up, that is then going to be your patient for the test. So let's say you two get paired up. You are going to be the patient for her to do her skills on. And then she is going to be the patient for you. So yes, you will be playing the patient for somebody else that's testing. 
very, very important that you not try to help them. When you are a patient, you are a patient, but you're going to be you. Don't try to win an Academy Award. Okay. Don't turn into a 90 year old invalid. So if you have, um, if you're the patient and somebody is assigned to ambulate you, and ambulate is just a fancy word for walk. And remember, if you remember the care plan we looked at earlier, it said 10 steps, right? So that's five steps in one direction, turn around and five steps back. So you're going to walk like you walk. Don't turn into a 90 year old invalid, right? So if somebody is going to walk me, I'm going to walk like I walk, which right now is with a limp, right? But I'm not going to do something like this, right? You want to be you. Good? Make sense? You cannot switch groups. You can't say, oh, I don't like her. I don't want to be pa paired with her. They don't take requests. Get through it. You also don't want to try to help somebody. And this is hard for students. This is hard because you're going to want them to pass, right? You guys are paired together. You probably want her to pass. And, you know, but you don't want to. squeeze their hand or don't do that because if the evaluators think that you're cheating both of you get disqualified so don't try to help anyone good questions all right so during the test turn the heat back on so during the test once they pair you up they're going to take group one into the testing room and the testing room is small. It's basically, if I put a wall here where the TV is all the way across, that would be the testing room. It's very small. It has two beds, a patient bathroom area, and room for two evaluators to stand there and watch you. Very small. It's also private. That means that everybody out here, so let's say you guys are in there testing, everybody out here cannot see or hear what's going on in that room. It's very private. It's not like you're up on a stage performing or anything. Um, and that's kind of important because they know you're going to be nervous. Everybody is nervous. for Nobody wakes up on testing day going, yippee, I get to test. It doesn't work like that. Everybody is nervous on testing day. They expect that. In fact, there's probably going to be somebody throwing up in the parking lot. They're so nervous. The evaluators understand that too. They're not there to make life difficult. They're actually not there to fail you. They don't want you to fail because we have a CNA shortage. And if you fail, that's one less CNA that we have out there helping with patients. We need you to pass. So it's not like they're being tricky or difficult or they want you to fail, That nothing like that. Basically, their goal is to make sure that grandma out there is safe from you. That's their focus is on grandma. So here's test secret number two. The test is not about you. It'll never be about you. The test is all about the patient. So when they're grading you, they're looking at the patient. Is the patient safe? Did you make the patient feel comfortable? Did you include the patient in what you're doing, right? So you don't want to do things to a patient. You want to do things with a patient. Big difference there. Make sense? Okay. So if your focus is on the patient and the evaluator's focus is on the patient, life's going to be good. You're going to pass. Does that make sense? So the test is not nearly as scary as people think it is. It's private, behind a door. The person you're doing the skill on is another CNA student. So it's not like it's a, you know, real patient somewhere that you have to worry about hurting. And we have to remember that the evaluators are focused on the patient, not you. If you can put all of that in your head, the test actually becomes a little less scary. Plus you have written instructions. If a care plan tells you exactly what to do, all you have to do is follow that, okay? 
Good. So during the test, you're gonna go into the testing room and the evaluators are gonna show you around. They're gonna show you this is the privacy curtain and this is how it works. This is the bed, this is how the controls work. This is your three drawer unit. Top drawer is grooming, middle drawer is bathing, bottom drawer is toileting. So it's kind of like a person, grooming, bathing, toileting. Okay. So they're gonna show you around, show you where to find washcloths and towels. All of that's gonna be covered, like a little mini orientation. But don't stress because they know that you're nervous and you're probably not gonna remember any of that. So during the test, if you can't remember where the washcloths are, you can ask where are the washcloths and they'll show them. What you can't ask is, so how do I do hand and nail care again? <laughs> okay, they're gonna tell you to do the best you can. So when uh, they, they're done with the orientation and they've showed you where everything is, they're going to give you a care plan set like this. This is a care plan set. You have this in your white book on page 19, 17 or 19, 17. So everything you see on 17 is this. These are in here for you guys to use, but these are the care plan sets. Now there's nothing random about this. For the test, there are 11 pre-selected sets of three skills. You are gonna get one of these 11. One of these is going to be your testing care plan set. This is not random. So on each one of these sets, there is one ADL skill. You remember that from the video we just saw? ADL is activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting. You're going to get one documentation skill. So a documentation skill would be like um, feeding where you document how much they ate and drank. Pulse, respirations, and emptying a urinary drainage bag, which is a catheter bag. Those are documentation skills. You will get one of those. Everybody gets a documentation skill. And the third category is a mobility skill. So mobility skill would be like ambulating a patient. Remember, that's a fancy word for walking. Or range of motion, which are some exercises we're going to learn how to do on patients. Or turning a patient over so they're laying on their side instead of their back. So mobility skills. Good. So you get one ADL skill, one documentation skill, and one mobility skill. And those are made up in pre-selected care plan sets, just like this. Now on page 17, you can see a number in a little circle at the top. That is how much time you would have to do that care plan set. Now, there's a formula here, it's not random. And on this, you'll see the formula down here. We're gonna go into that a little bit later in the program. These care plan sets that we have in the classroom also have on the back, the checklist. This is the actual checklist that those two evaluators are gonna have in their hands when you do the skill, the actual checklist. So when you do a step, they're going to check it off. You do another step correctly, they check it off. You do another step correctly, they check it off. If you don't do a step correctly, if you do it, but it's not correct, no check mark. Or if you just forget to do it all together, no check mark. So the only way to get a check mark is if you do a step correctly. Anything without a check mark is called a deficiency. At the end of the test, they're going to enter your deficiencies into the computer. The computer is the one that's gonna decide whether you passed or failed. The evaluators do not do that. They don't pass you, they don't fail you. They just watch your performance and check off whether something was done properly or not. Good? 
It's important that you understand that the evaluators do not fail you. That's not their job. They, they don't, first of all, they, they don't want to fail you, but it really is way more complex than that because um, So let's say for a second that um, we're going to do mouth care on this person. Okay. Is this a safe position for them to do mouth care? I'm not, if I'm going to brush somebody's teeth, is that safe? Why? Okay. All right. Because they're laying down. So what position should they be in, do you think? sitting up somehow, right? So either the head of the bed has to go up or if they can sit on the side of the bed, that's fine. Or if they can get up and go to the bathroom, that's even better, right? Standing over a sink, that's awesome. But we have to go by the care plan for this particular patient because I can't decide to get them up. I don't know what their, their issues are, their problems are. So the care plan is gonna give me some information here. Um, if I forget to put the head of the bed up, do you think that impacts the patient at all? Yes. What do you think? Yeah, because it could possibly cause them to die. I would say that impacts them. So putting the head of the bed up is probably a pretty important step. Now, I don't know if you've ever brushed your own teeth. Anybody ever brush your own teeth? You probably do it over a sink and you're probably positioned in a way that you're leaning over the sink because brushing teeth can be a bit of a messy business. You get foam and toothpaste and saliva and all kinds of stuff and it can drip out of your mouth and you really kind of want it to go in the sink and not on your clothing. So you lean forward over the sink. But if your patient is in bed, they probably can't lean forward too terribly well. So that means that they're probably gonna get some toothpaste on their clothing. We're gonna try not to do that, but chances are stuff can drip. So do you think we might wanna put a towel or something over their clothing just in case, since they're in bed? Has anyone ever died from getting toothpaste on their clothes? No. So which, step do you think is more important? Putting the head of the bed up or putting a towel over the chest? Head of the bed up, right? Because if we don't do that, there's a serious potential consequence to the patient. Remember I told you the evaluators are always um, focused on the patient, right? So you have two steps here for mouth care. We know we have to put the head of the bed up. We know we have to put a towel on but they're not going to weigh the same because one is way more important than the other. Does that make sense? So each of these steps that we're going to learn how to do, each of these steps are weighted. By weighted, I mean that the computer on the back end, move this over here, I just realized they can't see me on the YouTube world. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the computer assigns a number, a complexity number to each step that you're going to do. Now, this stuff is not published. We don't know, you know, whether step two is worth two points or four points. We, we don't know that that's on the back end of testing. We don't have access to that, but we do know that certain steps are so important that if you forget to do just that one step, it can fail you because there's a serious potential consequence to the patient. Does that make sense? Good. So my job is to help you identify those steps that might be critical to your success. So along the way, I'm going to be telling you, pay attention to this step and this is why. So we now know that when we're brushing teeth, we need to make sure we have the head of the bed all the way up because that's going to be a very important step. Good. Along the way, I'm gonna give you a lot of very important steps. But 
you know, putting a towel over the chest, that's a nice thing to do. It's a good thing to do, but it's not going to be critical to the patient's well-being if you don't. So that's why the evaluators can't grade you because each step has to be scientifically calibrated. Good. Now, the thing about Prometric, that's who we test with is Prometric. The thing that I really like about Prometric is that their testing is uniform across all Prometric states. So that means if you're testing in Miami and you're testing in Jacksonville and you're testing in Tampa and you're testing in Tallahassee, it is the exact same testing experience. Same scenarios, same checklists, same requirements. So very uniform. And that's what I'm going to teach you. Good? Questions? Questions? Okay, so you are going to get a uh, care plan set that has three skills on it. That skill set is going to be read to you by the, the um, evaluator. They can't even trust that you know how to read. So they're going to read it to you as well. And then they're going to give it to you when it's your turn to test. So this is yours. You're actually going to have it in your hand. It is yours throughout the entire test. So if you get halfway through a skill and you can't remember what that care plan said, Stop and go over and read it. Perfectly okay. You don't have to memorize it, but they do want to make sure that you know how important that care plan is. Now, when you get that care plan set, you're going to put it in a place that you can see it on a table, you know, somewhere in your vicinity. And then that other person is going to become your patient. Now, when you're the patient, you're going to get very specific instructions. You're actually going to get a script to follow. They don't want you going off script. Remember, it's all about um, test consistency, right? So if I've got you going rogue as a patient, that's not consistent. So when you are the patient, you're going to be told to be you, follow instructions, and be cooperative. So you're not going to be difficult. Now, anybody have anyone at home that you're going to be practicing on or with? Yeah. have any live humans at home? Yeah. Make sure that you tell your live human today before you ever start practicing, you're going to go home and you're going to tell them, I like my class. I think it's going to be fun. I'm going to be practicing. This is awesome. But you cannot be difficult. You have to follow the script too. So because the people at home, they're going to try to, to make things difficult for you. This is what our families do, right? <laughs> they try, oh, well, when you're out there in the real world, you're going to get this and that, and you're going to see this. That, that, that has no bearing on us right here, right now, practicing for the test. Tell them to be nice. They can be difficult later, but be nice now. Because if you get so, you're trying to learn normal right now. And if you get so derailed with all of these advanced techniques, you're not going to have a chance to really get normal down. Okay, does that make sense? Good. So tell your live humans at home to back it down a couple notches. They'll be good. All right. So I always have these up here. They're usually on the wall, but you've got your three skills on there and you have the name of the skill and then you've got your specific care plan for that patient. Name of the skill, care plan, name of the skill, care plan. When you get this and they read it to you, you need to do these three skills in the order listed. Very important, in the order listed. You can't um, move them around. So these are the actual checklists that the evaluator is going to use. And a lot of students ask, well, why don't you give me these? You know, why don't you provide these for us? And this is the one thing that I do not provide. And the reason is because it's written for RNs. And you're not RNs. So it's going to be really difficult for you to evaluate. Did you violate any infection control policies? 
you don't know. You have no idea because this is written for an RN. So what I did is I took this list, I filtered it through an RN brain, and I spit out instructions that are specific to the CNA. So if you turn to page 35 in your book, you'll see measure and record the pulse. Just below the title, you see something called the care plan. What do we know about the care plan? Follow it. So our care plan tells us patient will be lying in bed for skill. Take the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your readings. This is the care plan from the state exam. Below it, you see your supplies. What do you need to take a pulse? And then below that, you see step-by-step -step instructions. This one actually has 16 steps to taking a pulse. If you follow this, these step-by-step -step instructions, this is this. Okay, these checklists here, Every single one of these points here is in one of these steps. So this tells you what to do to meet that. So you can take this book home with you and it's yours. You can write in it. It is yours forever. You can take this book home and give it to a live human that you have laying around your house. And you can say, read these steps to me. And as they read the step, you do it. And they read it and you do it. And they read it and you do it. This is um, a really good way of starting out practicing. Have you ever learned something in, in school, like playing a musical instrument or something like that? And the, the teacher tells you, okay, go home and practice. And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to practice? I have zero confidence. I have no idea what I'm doing. And there's nobody at home to tell you what you're doing. So you go home and you just kind of play around at it, but it's not effective because you don't know if you're doing something right. Are you developing the right habits? That's what this book is designed for. It's designed to make sure that you're practicing the right way to develop the right habits. Now, after a while, you don't need them to read these to you. You need, them, you need to do the skill and have them read them to themselves and just let you know if you did anything wrong. So you can create your own evaluator at home long before you get to the test. Good. Questions? And then in that little gray box there at the end, you'll see some review questions, and that's designed to for you to find out, did you get the important points? Did you learn what you needed to learn? Have you ever read like a textbook chapter and you're like, I don't know if I got it all. <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, cause sometimes you'll focus on the wrong things. That, that's, you know, you're, you're on this diagram right here and you're trying to memorize it and it really doesn't have anything to do with anything, but you don't know that. So that's what these gray boxes are for. It's a way to kind of cut through all the chatter so you can make sure you've got the information you need for the test. Good. Questions? That's why this is like a workbook. Okay. okay. So after you do the skills test, you're gonna have a written test. It's 60 questions, multiple choice. You're gonna have 90 minutes to do the 60 questions. It's not overly difficult. Remember, you're not thinking, okay? They're gonna be scenario-based questions. They're gonna tell you, okay, this is your scenario. What are you gonna do when you see this? What are you gonna do when? And I've got a whole bunch of stuff where, where I'm going to prepare you for this. A lot of this is covered in my lectures, all the things that I tell you, all the principles we're gonna cover. 
So we cover this throughout. The problem is that a lot of people think that theory and skills are two separate things. They're not. Even though you have a written test and a skills test, they're not two separate things. They go together. If you're going to do hand and nail care, you need to understand the theory behind it. Why do we have the patient check the water temperature? You need to understand those topics. And that's what the written test is going to grade you on. Think of it like show and tell. Okay. Skill shows, the written tells. But it's all the same thing. Good. So the written test we're going to cover as we go through the program. But I also have a resource that you're going to want to download that's going to make it way easier for you. So you know that single sheet of paper that has my logo at the top? On that paper, you're going to see the free ebook. It says test coaching ebook. It's the third link there. You guys see that? Put a star next to it. You're going to want to do that like today. <laughs> it's a free book that I wrote and it's specific to developing testing, test taking skills. And it goes over the five things, the five main topics that you're going to see on the written test. It's very, very helpful. All right. That's what the ebook looks like. So when you go on the website, sign up for that, you'll download it and it'll live on your device, whatever it is. All right. So once you've taken the test, we'll take a break in a minute. Once you've taken the test, you're going to get um, results. You're going to get a results page for the skills and you're going to get a results page for the written. This one's for the written. It'll tell you at the top, congratulations, you have passed the written test. Down here, these are the five categories of questions, how many questions are in each category, and how many you got correct. So it doesn't really tell you much about the question itself. So it's not going to tell you you missed number four or what question number four was. It just says there were nine, you got seven right. Okay. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, how many can I miss and still pass? And that's really tricky. I can't tell you, okay, you missed 17 and, and still pass the test because it doesn't work quite that way. So each one of these categories, you can see how many questions are in each category. You know, you've got nine, nine, 12, 13, and seven. So each one of these categories, you have to get a passing grade in each category. So if you've got a category with seven questions in it and you need to get at least a 70%, that means if you miss four questions from that category, that's enough to fail you. Does that make sense? So it's not as cut and dried like, you know, you can miss 15 questions on the whole test. It doesn't work like that. But there's even, even more to this. And the ebook goes into this a little bit, but I'll just give you like a, a little teaser of this. There are a few critical concept questions on the state exam where it's not enough just to get a question right. You actually have to avoid the wrong, wrong answer. I know it's confusing, right? But any answer that puts the patient's life in immediate jeopardy, if you choose a, an answer, that puts the patient's life in immediate jeopardy, that one question can fail the exam. Does that make sense? So like fire safety, this one comes up quite a bit. Fire safety, and you're gonna learn this in chapter two. So over the weekend, you're gonna be reading chapter two in the, the blue book. It goes over fire safety. But we remember this using R-A-C-E, which is rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. First thing you want to do, patients and fires can never be in the same place at the same time. It's a pretty good rule. I like that rule, right? So if I have a fire in here, 
patients and fire cannot be in the same place. So what do I need to do? Please. Yeah, that's step one. Always, always rescue the patient. Always. Step one. I don't care how small the fire is, how confident you feel in your firefighting abilities. It doesn't matter. Patients and fire cannot be in the same place at the same time. You got to get the patient out of the way. That is a very serious rule. Then we got to let somebody know that there's a fire. So pull the alarm, activate your emergency system, whatever it is you need to do. But we got to let somebody know that we're about to play firefighter. And then we want to close the fire in wherever it's at. If it's in a room, that door needs to be closed. Because if our firefighting techniques go south, we don't want that fire to spread beyond that room. And then if and only if you feel comfortable and competent enough to try to put the fire out yourself, you can grab a fire extinguisher and use it properly. But notice that wasn't step one. You got a whole lot of things to do before you can get to that fire extinguisher. You got to rescue the patient. You got to sound an alarm. You got to contain the fire. And then maybe you can try to put it out. So if you had a question on the state exam that said, you notice a small fire burning in a trash can beside the patient's bed. What is your first action? Yes. Yeah, get them out. Yeah, get the patients out of the room. If you chose anything else, it puts the patient in jeopardy. Make sense? So it's not just enough to get the right answer. You've got to avoid the wrong one. Now, this, this question is a little bit tricky because if you chose um, pull the alarm, it wouldn't automatically fail you. If you chose um, contain the fire, it wouldn't automatically fail you. But if you went right to extinguish, you're trying to put a fire out with a patient right next to it, that would automatically fail you. Does that make sense? So there are two or three critical concept questions on the test where if you choose the wrong, wrong answer, it's an automatic fail. So you may look at this and say, oh my gosh, I only missed one question. I only missed one. How did that fail me? That's why it failed you. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, and then you've got, um, you're gonna have some feedback on the um, skills exam. Remember I said everything without a check mark is a deficiency? Well, it's gonna spit out all of your deficiencies. So it's gonna tell you, um, this is the step that you missed on hand washing. This is the step you missed on pulse. Because in Florida, we have two RN evaluators. We're the only state that does, by the way. Every other state, you only get one person judging you. Florida, we're special, we get two. So it, when you get this um, result sheet, this feedback sheet, anything that is listed twice counts against you. That means that both of those evaluators identified that as a deficiency. But if something only shows up once, it did not count against you. That means that one of the evaluators saw you do that step. It did not mark you off. The other evaluator said you didn't do it. So if it's listed once, it doesn't um, count against you. If it's listed twice, it does. Okay, good. Okay, so all of these checklists, again, are on the back of the um, yellow cards. They're always up here on the wall. You can take a look at them, but these aren't gonna help you a whole lot. This is for grading purposes, but this is what I use to create the skills that we're gonna learn moving forward. But this is kind of a fun activity for you. Um, when you have some skills under your belt and you're starting to practice, try to check yourself off or have somebody check you off using this because it'll help you kind of see things from that evaluator's perspective. And that may make you a little bit better test taker. So they are here, they're on the yellow cards, but you're not gonna find them in your book. All right, 
So let's go ahead and take our break. Um, it is now 11 o'clock. Let's come back at 11.15. And we're going to get into um, the other skills, we'll call it.
Sorry, guys, we've got to turn the thing back on. All right, so they're common traits across multiple skills. So you can even see here. So these are four more different skills. First two steps are the same. So we're just going to learn. It basically it comes down to 60 steps. And you're going to recycle those over and over across multiple skills. You've already learned four. It's all about the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the, if you can't follow the care plan, you report it to the, and while you're doing the steps, you're going to observe, right? So we already know four, so 56 to go, but I'll make it easy. All right. Same thing with the closing or the, end. so this is what we call the opening or how every skill is gonna start. So we're going to do the opening the same way for all skills so that these checklists get checked off. No matter what skill we're doing, the opening never changes. Same thing with the closing. At the end of every skill, the ending steps are all the same. We call that the closing. And if, um, you, know, if you look at these, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities here asking the resident about preferences during care, where um, they look at standard precautions and infection control for all of the skills, ask resident about comfort needs here, 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 and here, promote residents' rights, and promote safety. So you see the same steps over and over and over again. And that's what we're going to use for the closing. So every skill is gonna start the same way, Every skill is going to end the same way. So we're going to learn it once and do it over and over and over and over again. Now in the middle, we're going to do this really quickly here. So in the middle, you're going to have um, things that might be a little bit more skill specific. Um, so these are all of the principles that we're gonna learn. Skill rules, barrier rules, privacy blankets, scoot and roll, basin cleaning, closing, opening, glove rules, linen rules, washing, washing rules, shoe rules, and skill specific. So these are what we're gonna learn. It's what you see on the back. Um, we also have these here that you guys can play with as well. And for this exercise, Oh, that smells good. I'm going to give that one to you. All right. So if we were to look at this, so I, I just gave you guys. Um, some banners and it's the same banners as what we have on the back but if we looked at this um and we look at checkpoint one here make it bigger for you it says um does the candidate that's you greet residents let's stop there for a second greet resident so i want you to look at the the papers that i gave you and see if there's anything on any of those that is something around greeting the resident or introducing yourself or anything like that. It's on that one. What, what's the name of that one? The opening. So the opening is gonna cover greeting the resident, addressing by name and introducing yourself. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is all three of these are on the same line. So if you greeted the resident, hi, Mrs. Jones, and you address them by name, hi, Mrs. Jones, but you did not introduce yourself, you don't get a check mark. Even though you did two of them, because remember I said that 
anything you do but don't do correctly doesn't get a check mark. So when you have something like this, it has three steps on one line. You have to have all three steps to get credit. Does that make sense? So we're gonna do the opening the same way every single time. We're never, ever, 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 ever gonna change it. And that way it always meets the criteria. So here you can see the opening has us greening the resident, identifying the patient and, and introducing ourselves. So it's like a checkpoint too. Provide explanations to resident about care before beginning and during care. So do you have something on yours about providing explanations? Yeah, describe skill. Describe skill. So by describing the skill, we're meeting that checkpoint. So let's look at three. Support resident's arm in a manner to avoid dangling. Do you have something on yours about supporting the arm? Yeah. Okay. So here, we're always gonna support the arm. So this is skill specific. Where the opening is going to um, apply to every single skill we do, and the closing, which we're gonna see in a minute, is gonna apply to every sing single skill we do. This, the, the black banners, they are skill specific. So this has to do specifically with the pulse, okay? So let's keep going here. Use fingers, not thumb to take the pulse. You're gonna see that here, skill specific. So when I teach this, I'm gonna make sure that you understand all of these skill specific steps as we learn the skill. Good. So think of this as a really easy, um, convenient review for what you have on page 35. Remember all the 16 steps we talked about, right? This is a convenient review for that. Same thing for the next several. Oops, go back up here. Um, there we go. So the next several, three and four, are all going to be um, skill specific, but let's go to number six here real quick. Count pulse for one full minute. Well, if we looked at the care plan on the top of page 35, we saw that it told us to count for one full minute. So we follow the care plan. So skill rules, that care plan tells us what to do. We need to know that we're going to follow it. And then if we keep going down here, we documented because the care plan told us to, asking resident about preferences. Now this is where I, I really kind of wanted to, to get to. So we talked about the opening earlier, right? We said that we're going to um, identify our patient, introduce ourselves. We're going to explain what we're doing because that was all part of the opening. But what's interesting about this is that it's not um, always in order. So this is step number eight, like way down, step number eight. But it's going to go back to that opening again. So we have the opening in the, in the beginning, but we're actually going to be using what we do in the beginning to check off step number eight as well because we have to obtain permission. For everything that we do, the patient, remember I said we wanna do things with, not on patients. So everything that we do, the patient needs to be involved in it. And if we don't explain to the patient what we're doing and get permission, they're not involved. And that means that we're not going to get credit for that checkpoint, good? Okay. And then um, right here, this one, I want you want to bring your attention to. It says, in skill with clean hands. This is very, very important. But just as important as ending the skill with clean hands, 
we have to make sure that we have clean hands to begin the skill with as well. Now, this messes a lot of people up because they think that they um, should walk in the room and the very first thing they should do is wash their hands. And that's actually not the right order because the infection control is gonna grade us on this. We need to refrain from touching the resident before our hands are clean. So during the opening, we're not gonna walk right in and wash our hands first. We need to get permission from the patient. We need to know that they're gonna allow us to do this. So there's a whole lot of steps we have to do before we get to wash hands. So we're not gonna wash our hands the second we walk in because that's a little presumptive. If I walk in and wash my hands and say, hey, I need to take your pulse, is that okay? It kind of removes your ability to say no because I'm presuming that you're going to let me. So it gives the wrong impression. So we've got to go in and knock, say hi, Miss, identify your patient, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I need to get your pulse. Is that okay? And I'm going to pull the curtain. Then I'm going to go wash my hands. Now, <coughs> the reason that that order is important, let's think about these curtains for a second. Who touches those curtains? Everybody. Does everybody have clean hands when they touch those curtains? So would we consider those curtains clean or dirty? Does that make sense? Good. So patients in bed, they cough. Those secretions fly and they're going to hit that curtain. Patients in bed sneeze. Those secretions fly and hit the curtain. Patients in bed scratch what itches. So when they get out of bed, they open that curtain. Visitors scratch their butt in the elevator and then they open the curtain. But the worst offender by far here are healthcare workers because we don't really pay much attention. We'll empty the urine bag, you know, with our gloves on, give the patient a cup of water, and then we'll open the curtain. And now all of those contaminants are on the curtain. You think we should have given them a cup of water with dirty gloves on as well? We're gonna get to that too. So we need to have a little bit higher awareness as to what we're touching. And we need to understand the difference between clean and dirty. And in a clinical environment, that curtain can't be considered clean. They're only taken down and physically washed about once a year. Yeah, some places a little more, some places a little less. It depends on the, the setting, but on, on average, once a year. Now, housekeeping does a great job. I'm not, no shade on housekeeping here. You know, they, they use the disinfectant spray on the curtains in between patients. They get it as clean as possible, but to take it down and launder it is not done all that often. So we need to be aware that that curtain probably has every body fluid imaginable on it and some that we'd really, really rather not imagine. <laughs> so when we touch that curtain, what do you think the next thing we need to do is? Wash our hands, absolutely. So in order to meet this, guideline, you can't just walk in and wash your hands because the minute you touch that curtain, they're recontaminating. Does that make sense? Good. So let me um, go here. In skill with clean hands. This is the very last thing that we are going to do for every single skill. Every skill ends with this line. End skill with clean hands. The reason for that has to do with the patient experience. So I want to take just a minute and talk about the patient experience. So this is on page 13 of your book, of your white book. But this is something we don't normally really think much about, but I think we should. So when we're talking about patients in a clinical setting, let's think about that for a second. Um, if I want a vacation, if my, you know, I just, I've been working really hard, it's time to go on a break, I need a vacation. 
I can't call up my local hospital and say, okay, listen, I'd like to reserve a room for three days with a view. I'm on a vacation. Okay. You can't just make an, a reservation and check yourself in to a hospital, right? Anybody ever been to an ER? When you go to an ER, their goal is to get you to go home. It, you have to work really, really hard to get a bed in the hospital if you go through. I mean, you've got to be sick enough that you deserve one of those beds. And you have to be able to prove it, right? They don't just hand them out. So what that tells us is the very sickest people in our community are in this one place. And they can't just say they're sick. They have to prove that they're sick enough to be here. Otherwise, they go home. So the sickest people in our community are in one place. Now, because they're sick, that means their immune system is currently working. It's busy trying to take care of whatever's trying to kill them, right? So they're sick. We know they're sick and their immune system is busy. So we put those sick people with depressed immune systems all under one roof. Have you stopped to think about that? That's a scary place to be if you're sick and your immune system is not working properly. Now, these patients do a pretty good job of staying where we put them for the most part. Sometimes they'll walk around, but for the most part, they stay where we put them. They're not going in and out of people's rooms, playing bridge or anything like that. So the chance of this person catching what that person has, as long as they stay in their own area, is pretty low. Except for us. Because we go into this person's room, we do the things with this person that they need done, and then we leave that room and go into the next room. And do you know what we take with us? That's right. All of those cooties that this person had, if we're not careful and we don't wash them off. So when you wash your hands at the beginning of the skill, that's so that you have clean hands for this patient. When you wash your hands at the end of the skill, that's so you have clean hands for the next patient or for whatever's happening in the hallway. Because you'd be surprised at all the stuff that goes on in a hallway. <laughs> You need clean hands when you exit a room. Have to have clean hands. Does that make sense? Is that good? So the very last action we take at the end of every single skill we do is hand washing. Good. So we're going to start our skills with hand washing, but we have to do all the introductions first. We're going to end our skill with hand washing. And it's the very last thing we do. So this trips up a lot of people during the test because they'll do their closing. They'll give the patient the call light. They'll open the curtain. They'll do all the things I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And they'll go over and they'll wash their hands and then they'll realize they forgot something. And they'll go back to the patient and take care of whatever it is they forgot. And maybe open the curtain or give them a call light or whatever. So they, they do what they think they're going to do. They wash their hands. They realize they forgot something. They go back and into the patient environment. M make sure you're paying attention to this. What does this line say? In skill with clean hands. So that means that the very last step you do has to be hand washing. If you realize you forgot something and you go back to the patient and take care of whatever that is, what do you need to do again? Wash your hands. That line right there is responsible for about 50% of the failures on the test. Good. Okay. So not following the care plan and not ending the skill with clean hands, two of the biggest offenders on the exam. So by the time I'm done with you today, you're going to have everything you need to pass the test. <laughs> okay, so does that make sense? Are we good? Okay. All 
All right, so all the, um, so throughout this whole thing, we're going to learn all of these principles or banners. And those banners are designed to get you all of those check marks so that you pass the state exam the first try. So the, these are the principles that we're gonna learn. Again, you see them on the back wall. They're also on page 19 of your skip. So, I get this too confused. 19 and 17, I get confused all the time. 19 of your skills book. All of your banners are there. And you will have to learn them. Now, we're gonna learn them one step at a time, just like we learned the skill rules. We're about to learn the opening and we're gonna learn the closing in a few minutes. Um, but there's some other ways that you can learn this as well. We have flashcards. Let me show you real quick. These are the flashcards. So we have step-by-step -step instructions for how to do the skills. We have supplies, the supply you need, supplies you need for each skill. And then we have the principles. So these are full color flashcards that you can get while you're enrolled. So up until graduation day, they're $14.99. After graduation day, they go up to $19.99. So we give you a little bit of break there. So this is good just for review, memorization, you know, flashcards, it's what they do. But there's a funner way of doing it. We have a card game that works on these principles where you have to collect the sets of principles and stay away from the crappy caregivers because crappy caregivers will kill your score. It's a fun game that you can play with friends and family. They don't have to be medical. So I designed it so that you can learn while you're playing, but they'll just play with the colors and numbers. It's a really fun game to, to play as well. Um, and you do get a discount on that while you're enrolled as well. Normally it's $29.99. Um, you can get the card game for $19.99 while you're enrolled. Okay. So there's lots of different ways to learn this. We're going to have lectures. There's videos you can watch. There's flashcards you can get, and then the card game will help you if you want to do it in a little bit more fun way. Um, but lots of different ways for you to master this, this topic. So we talked about this, but I want to go over it one more time before we get into the opening. So as a CNA, to stay in our scope of practice, we're always going to rely on the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. That found, um, forms the foundation of what we do. On one side, we have CNAs do normal. Remember that CN, um, routine tasks on stable patients. If it's not routine or they're not stable, we don't do it. The principles, all these things on the back are going to guide our performance. They tell us how to do these skills. At the end of the day, it's always about the patient and we report all observations that keeps us firmly in our scope of practice. So this is an important thing for you to know. Again, it's on the back of your ID badge. You need to know these five things because that's what the entire course is going to be built on. But that's not all that we do. So CNAs um, can be delegated tasks. So in here, we're going to learn how to take vital signs, how to do hand and nail care, how to do foot care, partial bed bath, changing a bed, turning a patient over, transferring out of bed and into a wheelchair, feeding, dressing, growth. we're going to learn all this stuff, right? But that's just the start. When you get out there in a clinical setting, there may be skills that you're going to need to learn for that particular setting. And that's where delegation comes in because your nursing assistants, you can work wherever there's a nurse. You're there to assist the nurse. That means that you may need to learn some different skills. So for instance, let's say that you're working in a same day surgery center, okay? This is where you go in, get your gallbladder taken out and you go home at four, okay? And you're gonna work in pre-op, which is we're getting you ready to go back for surgery. And there's an opening, so you call her up and say, hey, we've got an opening here in post-op. 
So you would get hired and you're going to take care of patients between surgery and when they go home. So pre-op, post-op. Good? Okay. You two, even though you're both CNAs, you both have been trained in this classroom, have a totally different skill set needed to work in those two settings. Pre-op, you're going to help patients get into gowns, make sure that they have the little slipper socks on, um, make sure their dentures are out, help them go to the bathroom, all of those things that we need to do before surgery. Um, you would help patients when they come out of surgery. So you might be trained to take out a catheter. Now, you're not taking out catheters. They have no catheters when they come in. So different skill sets. Make sense? So how do you get this training? Well, most of it's going to be done on the job. Most places have an education coordinator and they're just gonna show you, okay, this is how you take out a, a catheter. Super easy, by the way. Super easy, um, but you have to be trained. So they're going to show you how, they'll probably watch you do it a time or two, just make sure you, you've got it down. And now that skill can be delegated to you. Okay, you've got the skill set, but she has to call in sick and they ask you to go over to post-op. You've never taken a catheter out in your life. Not required in pre-op, right? So you're covering for her, you're working in post-op and I'm the nurse and I come along and say, hey, what's your name? Jamie, right? Jamie, I want you to go, in, go take the catheter out of room six for me. They're getting ready to go home. Now you've never been trained to do this. Even though you're a CNA, went to the same school. I don't know who knows what. So what do you think you should tell me? That's right. You... For delegation, if it's an unfamiliar skill, your responsibility is to say, I do not have the training. I've never done that. I'm uncomfortable with it, whatever. Don't fake it till you make it. Does that make sense? So you would need to be trained to do that as well. So things can be delegated to you. Lots of skills can be skills that you may think, oh my gosh, can I really do that? As long as it's a routine task on a stable patient, the RN is comfortable with you performing that task and you have been trained. It also can't require any judgment. So I can't say, well, when the patient has 300 cc's of urine in the bag, then you can pull the, the, um, the catheter because that requires judgment. I can't have you judge anything. It's either can you do this or it doesn't get done. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can be trained to do all kinds of things. CNAs can be trained to um, interpret all the little blips on the screen with EKGs. CNAs can be trained to take blood. CNAs can be trained to give um, injections in certain places. DNAs can be trained to do several different things beyond what we're going to learn here, but it's very important that you understand that this has to be done on a stable patient, no judgment is required, and you need training. As long as those requirements have been met, you can be trained to do pretty much anything that a nurse can do. Now, the caveat to that is remember as long as you're under the care plan, I'm assuming all the liability. So even if I have you taking out catheters, right? I, I train you because you're covering for her and I've got you taking out catheters, that's still under my license because you're still under the care plan. Good? That makes sense? Okay, so don't be afraid to learn new skills. Every setting you're going to go to will require a new skill set from you. So don't be afraid to learn new skills, but don't ever accept an assignment that you haven't been trained to perform because that puts patients in jeopardy. So let's talk a little bit about these patients for a second. This is the patient experience. Anybody ever been a patient at a hospital? Anybody? Yeah. 
way. When I'm sick, like if I don't feel good, where do you think I want to be? That's right, at home. I want my nest. When I'm not feeling good, I want to be in my little nest. I don't want to be anywhere else. I just want to be in my home. And for the most part, I get my wish. I, you know, if I'm sick, I'm going to stay at home, roll up on the couch, watch a little Hallmark channel, maybe some Campbell's soup, whatever. Um, but I get to control things in my home. It's mine. But if I am sick enough that I can't be home, everything changes. Everything changes. Because remember, in my home, that's my domain. I call the shops. When I have to go somewhere else, I'm no longer in charge. And that's a very scary thing, right? Think about that for a second. Your patients want to be home. This is a very bad day for them. We also have to understand that most patients, if they're bad enough to be in a clinical setting, that means they're pretty bad. Remember, you had to prove you were sick enough to be there. So their mind is probably on, is this going to kill me? Am I going to make it? How is this going to impact my quality of life? Am I still going to be able to work? What is going to happen to my kids if something happens to me or my grandkids or whatever? They have a lot of things on their mind. Because remember, if they weren't very sick, they'd be home. But because they're here, that tells us that things are a lot more serious. And your patients are going to be pretty focused on that. It's scary. Now. On top of that, they're probably alone because very few people have somebody to stay with them 24 hours a day in a clinical setting. And most clinical settings won't even allow it. So that means that they're going to be alone for a significant portion of time. So they're not in their own home. They're a little preoccupied with their overall health and how it's going to impact their, their long term plans. And they're alone. Now, not only are they alone, but they are dressed in a thin hospital gown and not much else. And they are laying down. Now, there's a big difference between your vulnerability laying down and standing up. Which one do you think is more vulnerable? Laying down. So we now have no clothes on, we're laying down, we're in a strange place, surrounded by strangers, we're alone and isolated and vulnerable, and we're preoccupied about our current state of health. That is your patient's mindset when you walk in. So we need to be aware of this. Th this is going to impact how we relate to them. So we have to take a moment to put ourselves in their shoes. That means that everything we do, we need to slow down. We need to explain. We need to gain their consent and their partnership. Because I can guarantee you, if they are too afraid, they are going to say no to everything because they're afraid. And we can't touch patients without their permission. That's called battery. Even though they're in a clinical setting, that doesn't give you the right to do what you want with somebody else's body. So if they're afraid of you, they're not gonna consent to anything. This is where we need to really work on our bedside manner. We need to make sure we're smiling and we're approaching them from the front and we're making eye contact and we're doing all of those nice things that get them to trust us. Because at the end of the day, we're still a stranger. They don't know you. Just because you're wearing pajamas, we call them scrubs, but they're pajamas. Just because you're wearing scrubs doesn't mean they're automatically going to trust you. Does that make sense? 
So we need to think about that patient experience. We also need to understand that some patients may be very angry over the change in their, their circumstance. When you are at home right now, you are independent, right? You get yourself up, you go to the bathroom, you get yourself dressed, you brush your own teeth, you get your own food, go wherever you need to go. You're completely independent. Nobody needs to do any of that for you. You're in good shape. But when you have a patient who suddenly becomes not independent, they need help. That's a huge blow. It's a huge blow. So a lot of patients may have a, an anger response to that lack, that loss of independence, that need to depend on, or to rely on somebody else. And not just any somebody else, a stranger. And not just any skills, personal skills. You are going to be performing the most intimate of skills on people that don't know you. That's a hard pill to swallow. So we've got to make sure that we're approaching this the right way. Does that make sense? And that's where the opening and the closing come in. We can't cut corners here because we only have a very short amount of time to gain our patient's trust so that they'll allow us to do what we need to do. And it all starts with how we approach. Does that make sense? So every skill is gonna start the same way with the opening. The opening never changes. It's always done exactly the same. We've got multiple steps um, and every skill is gonna end with a closing. Closing is always done the same way, multiple steps. We're gonna learn those right in, in just a second. But I wanna talk to you about one other thing that kind of goes along with this. So I told you for the test, you were going to get three skills on a care plan set, right? This sounds familiar. And that's all correct but you're actually being graded for the test on five skills. So three that are on your list and two that are hidden, that they're not gonna talk to you about. I wanna talk to you about those real quick. So one of the things that you're going to be graded on is hand washing, but they can't tell you to go wash your hands. Because if I say, what's your name? Nicole. If I say, Nicole, go to the sink and wash your hands, I can grade that you know how, but I can't grade that you know when. So nobody's going to talk to you about hand washing. Nobody's going to say, what's your name? Novoli. Novoli. Um, nobody's going to say, Novoli, go wash your hands. They're going to watch what you do and grade your hand washing at the beginning and the end of the skill. Does that make sense? So even though hand washing isn't on here, it's still a graded skill. Now, the last skill you're graded on is something called indirect care, and it's a whole lot harder to explain. So I'm gonna show you two different ways of doing skills. And I want you to tell me if you were the patient, which one you would want, okay? Which CNA would put you at ease? So I'm gonna pick on you because I pick on the person at that chair. Don't take anything I say or do personally over the next couple of minutes and just be cooperative, okay? So this is a demonstration of indirect care. All right. So I'm gonna to look totally different doing this uh, two different ways. Here we go. Hey, Ms. Jones, I'm, Ms. I'm Patty. I'm your CNA today. I need to do your uh, vital signs. Is that all right? I really would not say, oh, excuse me, <laughs> RBF. <clears throat> Clean hands. Huh. Start, stop. Is there anything else you need while I'm here? Okay. Oh, it's over there.
wash my hands, document. What do I have to do at the end of every skill? Wash my hands again, that's right. Because we end the skill with clean hands. Okay, good. So how many of you guys have seen that CNA out there? Anybody seen that CNA? Do we need any more of those? No. So let's see if we can improve on this just a little bit. Okay, let's see if we can improve. Here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm good. I am fantastic. I need to get your vital signs. Is that okay? Yes. I'm just going to go over, close your curtain, and I'll be right back. I'm going to close the curtain, wash my hands. I have clean hands. All right, Ms. Jones, if I can have you rest your arm on the table, this is going to take me about a minute, but I'll let you know when I'm done, okay? All right, ready, start, and stop. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Uh, magazine, please. Would you like a magazine? Yes, okay, you. let me see what I can find. Um, find a magazine. Here you go. Magazine. <laughs> um, are you comfortable? Is there anything else that you need before I go? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and open the curtain. The call light is there. We're going to pretend that you can reach it. So I'm going to open the curtain, wash my hands, document, and wash the hands again, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. So what was the difference between those two CNAs? Okay. Okay, so let's look at specifics. Yes. So CNA number one didn't look at the patient. Remember that half of our job is observation and reporting. Remember that? So if we're not looking at the patients, we're not doing half of our job. So eye contact, very important. What about the way that I face the patient? So CNA number one, face the wall. That makes the patient feel like they're not really involved in this. CNA number two, actually approach the patient from the front. What about facial expression? Was that different? Oh, yeah. Facial expression? Kind of of okay. Tone of voice. There's a big difference mm -hmm. between the tone of voice. But what about rate of speech? Did you notice CNA talked, one talked so fast? Mm -hmm. And CNA number two slowed down the speech to make sure that the patient understood what I said. You guys see the difference there? What about explanations? Was that different? CNA number one just tapped the, the uh, table like the patient should know what I'm doing. The patient didn't take a CNA class. Don't expect the patient to know what a CNA does, <laughs> right? So we have to explain it. Can I have you lay your hand on the table or rest your arm here? Or let them know what you need from them, right? So a lot of differences there. That's called indirect care. And it is so important on the test that it is graded completely separately from everything else. That's how important it is. Because just because you can take vital signs doesn't mean you should be certified. We need people that can take vital signs with a good bedside manner. <laughs> Those are the ones that need to be certified. So they have a whole category there that they can disqualify you on. And that's why I teach you to do things a very specific way. But I don't want you to just think, okay, well, this is just for the test. When I get out there in the real world, I can do what I want. Don't fall into that trap. Your patient needs caregivers that are competent and compassionate. Don't forget that, that aspect of it. Guys, someday I'm going to be in the body and the bed, probably sooner than I think, actually. Um, I, I know I have surgery in my future, and I'm really, really not looking forward to it. I'm going to be the body in the bed. My job is to train you to take care of me. So don't forget this when you're out there. I'll remind you. Could be your mom or your grandma. Absolutely. Absolutely. So does that make sense? Everybody understand indirect care? Any questions on that? Okay. Patient experience is very important. Don't, don't forget that these are people, not just a job. 
So let me explain to you how we're going to get from here to there, and then we're going to get into the actual skills or the opening and closing. All right. So if you look uh, here at, at this, the paper, the syllabus, at this guy here, this tells you how we're going to get from here to there in four weeks. So the first column is what we're gonna do in class each class period. So today we learned skill rules. Does that sound familiar? We're going to learn the opening and closing very shortly. We just talked about indirect care and I'm gonna show you hand washing in just a few minutes. So that's what we're covering in class today. The second column are lectures that I'm giving in class. So we talked about what to expect on the CNA exam. We talked about delegation. We talked about the testing care plans. And I've talked to you about the principles on the back wall and how we're going to use them. In the white skills book, the spiral book, there are lessons associated with each one of those. So that second column is additional homework reading for you if you wanna review those topics. And remember, it's workbook style, so there's always some questions there to make sure you got what you needed to get. The third column is the dreaded homework column. Nobody likes this, I get it. But you're going to go home and read chapter one in the blue book. Now that blue book is yours for the class. So you're gonna take it home, leave it there. You're gonna use it for homework reading, but I'm gonna collect those on the very last day. You won't need it after that. If you, for whatever reason, decide you absolutely positively have to buy this book, you can, but I don't recommend it because once you do the reading, you'll never go back to it again. It'll just be an expensive paperweight, okay? Um, keep up with the homework reading, save yourself some money. But just because you did the reading doesn't mean that you learned what you needed to learn. You need to take a quiz just to make sure that you got the important points. So in the white book, if you go to page 132, you'll see a little quiz. So you're gonna take the quiz on page 132 and then you'll go to the very last page in the book. Very last page. And that is your answer key and you'll grade it. When you come into class, on Wednesday, I'm gonna go right down my little list. I'm gonna say, Christy, how did you do on chapter one? Jane, Nicole, Jamie, Novali, Isabella, Nadine, and April Lynn. How did you do? Now, ideally, you should be able to give me a percentage because if you look at the bottom of the um, answer key on the very last page, you'll see the grading scale to tell you if you missed one, you got a 95, if you missed two, you got a 90, and so on. So you'll tell me what your score is. If you, didn't, if you didn't do the conversion, just tell me I missed two or I missed three or whatever. I want you to take this quiz as many times as you need to to get 100. My class is not about grades. I could care less about grades. When I'm the body in the bed, I'm not going to look up and ask, what'd you get on chapter four? I don't care. What I do hope is that you learned enough about chapter four that if I have a blood clot, you're gonna recognize the symptoms of that and tell the nurse so that they can assess me and I can get the treatment I need, right? Grades don't mean anything. Knowledge means everything. So take the quiz as often as you need to. Now the last column there where it says additional activities, sometimes we'll get to these in class, sometimes we won't. Um, like we did the activity on page 12 together. That's good. Um, and we talked about indirect care. But we won't always get to these. So this is something that you probably do want to pay attention to and cover on your own. So think of this more as self-directed learning. Good. Now, if for some reason you're not able to come to class on a specific day, let's say Wednesday, you wake up and you have a flat tire and you just can't make it. You can 
you can access the live stream. So right now I'm live streaming. So tell everybody hi, YouTube world. Hi, YouTube world. Um, we're live streaming this. And right now I have uh, 17 people on right now watching this live from all over the nation. Um, so if you can't come to class, then you can at least join live on YouTube so you can, you can still get the same information, right? In the comfort of your own home and your pajamas. That would be nice. You'll always get more out of it coming to class. But this is available to you. Now, after this is over, after this class is over, this is going to be available for replay as well. So you can, um, you know, hit play. And do you guys know about the little gear at the bottom of a YouTube player? It looks like a little gear. If you click on that settings, you can actually speed me up to like double time. <laughs> so it takes a four hour class and I talk like a chipmunk. I mean, it really makes me sound funny, but you can condense it to um, half time. So it's a good way for you to review the information as well. And this is up there for you. And then you'll have the online program as well. Did you guys uh, fill out the um, email? Yep, you guys did. Okay. All right, I'll make sure that all of you get the invitations for the, uh, the um, online course as well. So everybody understand how the syllabus is going to go? If you can't come to class, make sure you tune in live or at least watch a replay. But these are the topics we're going to cover. You're going to want to make sure you read um, the second column and the fourth column and do the homework in the third column. So that's how the syllabus is going to work. Blue book goes home with you, stays home. We don't work in that one. Don't highlight or make notes because you're going to return that one. The white book is yours forever and always. So you can color in it, highlight it, whatever you need to do, it is your book. All right, so let's get to the opening. The opening starts every skill and it always starts the same way with a knock. Always starts with a knock. Now, a lot of people try to skip the knock thing for whatever reason. I don't know why, but a lot of people forget the knock. If you look at, remember these checklists, right? This, these are the checklists from the state exam. The same thing on here, back of here, same checklist. The big difference is these are readable for me. These are not, <laughs> writing is super small. But well, let's just uh, take one at random, okay? So I am now looking at dressing a resident who has a weak arm, that's a skill. And if I look here at Now I gotta find dressing a resident, hold on. Okay, so if I'm looking at dressing the resident, these, these checkpoints here, um, and I'm gonna pass this around so you guys can all see it. Under indirect care, promoting residents' rights during care, announce self or knock before entering room. So if you look at the first bullet point under 17, I'm gonna pass this around so you guys can all see it. This bullet point is on every single skill. So we have to knock for every single skill. And if you don't knock, notice where that bullet point is on 17, right? There's several more bullet points as well. So if you don't knock, you don't get credit for that entire set of steps. You guys see how important knocking is, right? So if you miss just knocking, there's a whole set of things that you're going to miss. Why is that important? Well, let's think about that patient for a second. We talked about the patient experience, right? So you're not at home. 
you're in a strange place surrounded by strangers, not dressed appropriately, laying down and vulnerable. So remember, they're also pretty self-absorbed, right? Because they're thinking, I'm dying. Every patient in the hospital is dying. Just ask them, they'll tell you. Every one of them. So if your patient is a little self-absorbed, understandably, and vulnerable, how easy do you think it's going to be for them to sleep? What do you guys think? Probably not very easy. So let's add sleep deprived to that list. What does that do to your mood? Oh yeah, irritable, absolutely. So I'm already cranky being sick and now I'm really irritable because I'm sleep deprived. So I finally drift off finally drift off. And as I'm floating, sleeping, I hear a sound. And my eyes fly open because remember, I'm feeling pretty vulnerable here. I'm in a strange place surrounded by strange people. And that door does not lock. And I'm trying to sleep. I don't feel secure at all. I hear a noise and my eyes fly open and there is somebody standing over me with a sharp object. What do you think my reaction is gonna be? Oh yeah, I'm hitting first and asking questions later. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. You have to understand your patient's mindset. They are not in your facility. You are in their safe space. You have invaded their safe space. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I just um, went on vacation not too long ago and um, stayed in, in several different hotels, right? Um, I would not have felt comfortable staying in a hotel, strange place, strange city, all the people in all the rooms around me, I don't know. They're complete strangers. I would not be able to sleep unless that door was locked. How many of you guys would just be comfortable having the door wide open, propped open in a hotel while you're trying to sleep? What do you guys think? And yet that's what we do to patients in hospitals all the time in nursing homes. They are in a strange place surrounded by strange people and we prop their door open and go in and out at our own whim. Your patients are not going to feel secure. I wouldn't, and I don't blame them for not feeling secure. So we need to understand their point of view. It's not about us, who's it about? The patient. So once you get that mindset, you understand why these steps that I'm going to go over with you are so important. When that door is open, even though it's open, we need to give a courtesy knock so they know we're coming. You never want a patient to open their eyes and see you looming over them. They will take it as a threat. They will. I would. So you need to make sure that they know you're entering their space. You are about to invade it. So you must knock. Now, if the door is open, it's a courtesy knock. We're knocking as we enter. Hey, Mr. Jones, it's Patty, your CNA. If the door is closed, I'm not invading. Think of all the things you do behind closed doors. Think of all the things you do behind closed doors. Any of those things could be happening. There are some things in life you cannot unsee. Do not go into a closed door, okay? So you wanna knock and wait. If you don't hear anything after a couple of seconds, knock again. If you still don't hear anything, crack the door. Is everything okay in here? Okay. But don't just assume it's your facility, your room, your patient. You have the right to go in. You don't. Good? Does that make sense? 
So knocking, super important. If you miss knocking, there's a whole checkpoint that you lose. And there's some pretty important stuff in there. So knocking, super important. For the test, we don't have to wait for them to say, come in. If they do, great. If they don't, that's fine. But you do have to knock. Once you enter the space though, you've got to identify your patient by name. Now this is verbal. Well, there's no ID bands to check for the test because most patients don't have ID bands. If it's where the patient lives, there's no ID bands. Do you put an ID band on when you go home? No, do you? No, if it's your home, it's where you belong. It's where you live. There's no ID bands. That would be silly, preposterous, right? So the only time that we have ID bands is a temporary residency. So hospitals, um, same day surgery centers, some outpatient or um, uh, uh, inpatient uh, therapies and rehabs, but the amount of patients in those settings is so small. ID bands are a very small part of what we do. Anybody ever go to a doctor or a walk-in clinic? Do they give you ID bands? No. So when the healthcare provider walks in the room, they probably say something like, um, what was your name again? Jane. Okay, so this is Jane. If I walked in the room and I said, Hi, Rebecca, how are you today? What would you tell me? That's not my name. That's right. Do you want what I've got in store for Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. So we address people by name or we ask them, can you please state your name for me? Either one is fine. You either call them by name, they'll let you know if it's not them, or you can ask them to state their name. Either one of those is fine, but for the test, it will be verbal, just like that. Even in a clinical setting with ID bands, those ID bands cannot be relied on for identification because they're often wrong. They're often wrong. Um, so you can't rely on an ID band. Verbal is always best. Now, some of you, are thinking to yourselves, well, what if the patient has dementia? What if they can't identify themselves? What yeah. do I do then? Well, remember that whole process we talked about, the whole circle thing, right? The RN assesses the patient, develops a care plan, gives us tasks, we do the task, we make observations, and then we report them back to the RN. Remember that whole system? Okay, well, that works here too. So as the nurse, remember assessments always start with the nurse. I went in and did an assessment, realized the patient is unable to identify themselves. So I would address that on the, what, what do I make up after assessing? The care plan. So the care plan is gonna tell you what to do in that situation. So we already have a system in place for that. Isn't that cool? We don't have to think, not our job. Well, let me explain to you what happens when you think. Why, the, why I harp on this, why this is so dangerous. So there was a case a couple of years ago, a CNA worked in a long-term care setting. And in this particular facility, they had all their diabetics down one hall. And there was one diabetic that was particularly brittle. Now brittle in terms of diabetes means that we have a really hard time um, regulating the blood sugar. So it goes super high and then it goes super low and it doesn't matter what medications or what foods, it, it just kind of has a mind of its own. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Very difficult to control. So this one patient, this male patient was a very brittle diabetic and the CNA that was working there would notice the patient would get um, confused, forgetful, start to shake. Uh, get all pale and sweaty and would go tell the nurse, hey, patient's got these symptoms. And the nurse would get a cup of orange juice, put a couple packets of sugar in it, mix it up and take it to the patient. They drink it. Patient got better every time. 
And um, this went on for months, months that the CNA noticed the symptoms, told the nurse, the nurse gave the patient sugar and orange juice, patient got better. Now on this particular day, this particular shift, the nurse is off the unit with an emergency. Another nurse that's supposed to be covering was on break. So the patient has symptoms, the CNA doesn't really have anybody to go to. And the CNA makes the decision, well, I've seen the nurse put the sugar in the orange juice, give it to the patient, the patient gets better. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. So the CNA puts the sugar in the orange juice, gives it to the patient, the patient drinks it, patient says, thank you, CNA leaves. 30 minutes later, the patient is unresponsive on the floor. They bundle the patient up, send them off, 911 to the hospital, the patient dies three days later. The problem here is that the CNA did not follow our track, right? The CNA follows the care plan or reports to the nurse. There is no third door that says the CNA can do what the nurse normally does. CNA follows the care plan or reports to the nurse. So the CNA chose door number three over here that doesn't exist. What the CNA didn't know was the patient had a continuous blood glucose monitor on. And when the patient started getting symptoms, the, the nurse would just look up what the blood glucose was and noticed it was low, gave the patient orange juice and sugar, and that brought the blood sugar back up until the patient could get a snack, something with protein to help normalize the blood sugar levels. The CNA didn't know that part. All they saw was the doing. And that's an important thing for you to understand because as humans, we focus on the doing. And this is gonna go right back to the very first thing we talked about. I asked you to describe a CNA to me and you guys all described what you thought CNAs did. You guys remember that? It's what we focus on. It's what we see, what we're familiar with. The problem is that 99% of nursing is not something you can see. It's something that happens up here in the nurse's head. 99% of nursing is here, not here. So if you're imitating what you see them do, you are completely unaware of what they know that led them to that. Does that make sense? Super important that you understand that. 99% of nursing is not what you see the nurses do. So that means that if you go to nursing school, there's a whole lot of things you have to learn to be able to think in the right way. Is that good? Make sense? Nursing is not what you see them do for the most part. Now you'll see them do a lot of things. Give medications, start IVs, regulate fluids, um, do treatments, wound care, tube feedings. So there are things that the nurses do, but most of the nursing process is here. Okay, good. I'm plugged into a lot of CNA groups on Facebook, a lot. And it makes me laugh a lot because a lot of the CNAs out there in clinical world kind of have this backwards. They think that the nurses are there to help them. What is our title? Yeah, certified nursing. Well, we're not plumbers, so that makes sense, right? Assistant. So we have to be careful not to get this role reversed because we pay attention to what we see people do. Remember, there's a lot on the back end that we can't see. So be careful about that too. 
if the nurses are spending all of their time helping you get patients out of bed and on the toilet and feeding and all the things that we need you to do to help free up our time, then there's nobody left to do the thinking part. And that's a problem because then patients aren't going to get the right care. Good. Does that make sense? It cracks me up how many of these groups think that the nurses should be helping them. Now, if you've got a nurse that can help you, that's awesome. And, and I tried, whenever I was working in, in clinical, I tried to help the CNAs as much as I could because they're helping me, right? It's not your tasks and my tasks. There are patients and this is all stuff that needs to be done. So whenever I was able to, but if I was sitting at the nurse's station trying to review lab work and coordinate tests and things like that, it's very difficult for me to leave that and go take care of something routine that I can ask you to do. Okay. So we have to go into this with right expectations. Now, those of you who go on for nursing, treat your CNAs well. They are the reason that you get to do what you do. Right? If I had to spend all my time helping people brush teeth, I'm not going to get to do anything nursing. So I have to treat my CNAs well because you let me do nursing. So it should be a team. It should be us versus whatever's trying to kill the patient. If it's me versus the CNA, whatever's trying to kill the patient is going to win. So we got to make sure we're on the right team. Good? Makes sense? All right, so the first thing that we do is knock. That's the first step. We don't have to wait for her to come in, but once we enter, we're gonna identify our patient by name. Hi, Mrs. Jones, that's all we have to do. For the test, everybody is Mr. or Mrs. Jones, everybody. One name, makes it easy. Hi, Mrs. Jones. And then you have to identify yourself by both name and title. You can't just walk in and say, hey, I'm Patty. So who cares? Are you Patty the person with the cookies? I like that, Patty. Or are you Patty with the needle? Not so much, <laughs> right? So we need to give them expectations of who we are and what role we're about to play in their life. So my opening should sound like this. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty, and I'll be your CNA today. I like to throw in a how are you or how's it going or something like that. I want to find out a little bit about my patient pretty quick because remember, I have to get consent, right? We can't touch somebody without their consent. That's called battery. I have to get their consent, but I actually kind of want to know where we stand before I get into the whole what I'm going to do and, and all of that. If I walk in and I say, hi, I'm Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you feeling? If you say, oh, horrible, I've got a headache, I'm nauseous, I think I'm going to throw up, well, whatever I had planned, out the window. Remember that CNAs do normal. Routine tasks, stable patients, headache, nausea, think you're going to throw up, that is not normal. <laughs> I can't do anything on that patient because that's not normal. So if I know that to begin with, if I know it up front, if I'm able to get to that pretty quick, it saves me a ton of time. Okay. So, hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Hopefully, they'll say, oh, I'm fine. And then we can move on. Remember, for the test, you are going to be given a script. You're going to be told to be cooperative. So, you will say, I'm good. I'm fine. Um, once I get a sense of how my patient is, then I'm gonna explain what I'm there for. So I am here to insert name of skill here. I, you can say it any way you want to. You can say, I need to get your pulse. You could say, I need to get your vital signs. You could say, um, I wanna measure your heart rate. However you wanna say it, nobody cares. Nobody cares. If you are really stressed for the test, and some of you will be, some of you will be, if you are super stressed for the test, you can pick up that care plan set 
and you can, I am here to measure and record a resident's radial pulse. Okay, you can read it right off the care plan if you want to. All of that is fine. But the whole point of all of that is to get your patient's consent. So they need to know what you're doing. So you're gonna explain what you're doing and then you're gonna ask the most important question in the healthcare. Is that okay? Can I? Patients have the right to say no. They can say no at any time for any reason. And they can say no in the middle of a skill. If a patient says no or stop, you go hands off. You do not have the right to force a patient to do anything. In fact, here's how important this is. There are only three people in the entire, three types of people in the entire world that has the ability to trample somebody's rights legally. And two of those are temporary. So police officers can suspend your rights temporarily. Doctors can suspend your rights if they feel that you're a danger to yourselves or others temporarily. There's an expiration date on that. The only person that can make it any longer than that is a judge. That's it. CNAs, you cannot force a patient to do anything. Nurses cannot force a patient to do anything. That's a legal principle. And I know we see it out there. It is scary some of the things that I see out there. But legally speaking, you don't have that right. So we have to be careful, set the right expectations. So we're gonna ask the patient, is that okay? Now, what do we do if they say no? Okay, document it, but who, tell the nurse. Yeah, we don't have to solve that problem, but when you go to the nurse and you say, hey, Henry won't let me give him a shower, do you know what they're gonna ask you? Why? Why won't Henry let you take a shower? Why, why, why? So if you can get that information from the patient, it's better. But you have to be nice, don't be mean. Well, why not? Don't you understand I've got a million things to do and you're slowing me down? It's not really the impression we wanna give here. We can say, can I ask why not? Is this a bad time? Are you not feeling well? What's going on? So you wanna be nice about it, but try to get a little information. It may be as simple as it's not a good time for them. Their family is coming and they don't want their foot in a bucket of water when their family walks in. It may be that they're just not feeling well, or it may be that they're getting ready to go to an activity and this isn't convenient. Or it may be that the last person that did that skill hurt them. That's the most common reason people refuse skills. Do you think that's something we need to know? Sure, because there's a training opportunity there. If somebody's hurting patients, we shouldn't be hurting patients. So if somebody's hurting patients, then maybe we need to know so that we can give them the training they need so that we're not hurting patients. Good, makes sense. Any questions? All right, so. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty, I'm your CNA today, and I need to whatever, is that okay? When they say yes, and remember for the test, they will be pleasant and cooperative, so they're gonna say yes for us. So once they say yes, we're gonna pull that curtain. Now, what do we know about that curtain? It is very dirty. So the very next thing we're going to do is go wash our hands. Once we've washed our hands, then we can get whatever supplies we need to do the skill. Don't get supplies until your hands are clean. Clean supplies need clean hands. Does that make sense? 
So the opening is done at the beginning of every skill all the time, never changes, always the same. Good. Now the closing, again, at the end of every skill, all the time, never changes, always the same. But there's a whole lot more steps in the closing. So in your white book, if you go to page 22, we'll go over the closing. Now, the easy way to remember this is there's six C's to the closing. The first four, the order doesn't matter. Nobody cares, however you want. But comfort, curtain, call light, clean environment, those four, nobody cares how you do it. But you do have to ask if they're comfortable and they need to hear that word specifically. Are you comfortable? They have to hear the word. So make sure you work it in somewhere. Nobody cares where, but you've got to address comfort. You want to open that curtain. Don't leave a curtain closed unless there's a need. So if the patient requests it, or if the nurse has it in the care plan, that's fine. But generally speaking, the curtain should not be closed all the time because people are in general social creatures. When you have the curtain closed for a long period of time, it isolates the patient. Isolation can lead to depression, um, way too much introspection, can lead to some bad, bad outcomes. So we want to make sure the patient has the ability to interact with others. So having that curtain open is important. They have to have their call light. And not only do they have to have the call light, you have to tell them they have the call light. So here is your call light. So you're either going to put it right beside their hand or in most cases in their hand. And I usually tell them how to use it. If you need me, press the red button. But you have to talk about the call light. And the environment needs to be clean when you leave it. Now, that's just a good general nursing principle. Always leave your patient looking better than you found them. So straighten the sheets. Make sure there's no trash on the floor or on the table. Just make sure everything looks good. Those four, the order doesn't matter. However you want to do it is fine. Give them the call light, then open the curtain. Clean the environment and then ask about comfort. Nobody cares. However you want to do it, but all four have to be addressed. So you're going to have to come up with some sort of a little memory rhyme, comfort, curtain, call light, clean. So that way you make sure that you know all four and you've addressed all four. But once you have done that, once you're done with those four things, you need to go clean your hands, right? So we're going to go wash the cooties off. If we need to document, that's going to happen after we've washed our hands because that pen goes home with you at the end of the day. You don't want to touch anything that goes home with you at the end of the day with unclean hands. Does that just, remember, these are germs that are bad enough to make somebody sick enough to not be home. You don't want those in your home. You do not want these germs in your home. You don't want them in your pocket either. So anything that goes home with you, you have to have clean hands to touch. So your pen, your keys, your cell phone, your lunchbox, make sure you've washed your hands before you touch. But remember that rule that we went over a little while ago, we have to end the skill with clean hands. So if we document, what do we need to do again? Wash your hands. To... Yep, yep. Also it says here the closing will be done at the end of every basic care. Does that mean like when we do the test, we have to start with a knot and with the close? Okay, so can you hold that yellow thing up for me? This one? Yep, that one. So you see how that has three skills on it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you see how this has three skills on it? 
the evaluators are going to tell you that you have to um, perform these three skills in the order listed. So you're going to do skill one, skill two, and skill three, but you have to do them as three separate patient encounters. So you're going to do um, the opening, skill one, and the closing. And then you're going to say, I'm done, or I'm finished, or my task is complete, or I don't care how you do it. Nobody cares how you do it, but you have to say something to end that skill before you move on to this one. And you're going to do your opening, skill two, and your closing, and then declare that it's done. And then you're going to do your opening, skill three, and the closing, and then declare that skill three is done. Now, the reason that you have to declare, and nobody cares how, my skill is done, my task is complete, whatever. But the reason that you have to do that is because you are allowed to make corrections during the test. So let's say you get all the way done with the skill and you realize that you did not close that privacy curtain before you did your skill. It remained wide open the whole time. Now, we know that that was a checkpoint. We missed the checkpoint. We don't want the deficiency. So we could say, correction, I would have closed that curtain before I washed my hands at the beginning of the skill. Now remember that checklist, right? Everything that you do correctly, you get a check mark. If you don't do something, no check mark. So when you correct it, you get a check mark. And the paper doesn't know whether you did it or just corrected it. It, it counts the same but you can only make corrections up until you say, my skill is done. That's why you have control over the ending of the skill, but you have to declare it. They're not gonna let you go on to skill two until you've closed out skill one. Because you are saying, it's, it's like hitting a red button on a game show, final answer. You're locking it in, no changes after that but they put that in your lap, you get to declare. So at the end of the skill, I want you to stop and think about your skill. <coughs> think, is there any changes that I need to make? Are there any corrections that I need to consider? <coughs> so it's important that you um, don't rush. You'll have plenty of, we're gonna get into skills timing a little bit later, but don't rush. You've got all the time you need. Think about your skill before you end it. Okay, good. Any questions on that? That hurts. <laughs> all right. All right, so just to um, recap the closing, we're gonna ensure there's a clean environment. We do want the bed height and lowest position. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more later on. For the test, you do not ever have to raise the bed up for any skill. Like the skills, the, the beds do move. They, they raise up so you don't have to bend, but for the test, you're not ever required to do that. If you do, however, you must lower the bed at the end of the skill. We're gonna ask about comfort. We'll offer a magazine. This has to do with comfort because again, people are social creatures. We like entertainment. If you just let us lay there in bed with nothing to do, man, our minds are gonna go in a million different directions and none of it's gonna be good for anybody. So um, entertainment or distraction is important. And that's why we're gonna offer a magazine. Now I know, I know, guys, in a clinical setting, we are not passing magazines around. I get it. But what we're doing by offering that magazine is letting the evaluators know that we understand that distraction or entertainment or some sort of mental activity is important. It's not just physical comfort. It's emotional comfort that we're focusing on as well. Um, adjust the head of the bed if necessary. Again, this goes to comfort, right? So these are under comfort. We're gonna open that privacy curtain. We're gonna give them the call light. We're gonna wash our hands, document and wash again if we need to. So there's a lot of steps here. There's a, I mean, you compare that to this, that looks easy. That looks easy. So there's a lot of steps here. 
So if I were working with this patient, let me, um, I can't turn that one off. If I, if I were working with this patient here, my opening would sound like this. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. And I need to whatever, insert name of skill here. Is that okay? Um, of course, you can always ask, how are you feeling? That's not required for the test, but it is a good practice to get into. Uh, is that okay? Yes, okay, let me go close your curtain. Wash hands, do the skill. Once I'm done with the skill, thank you very much, Mrs. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine before I go? No, are you comfortable? Good, let me just arrange the sheet for you because we always leave our patient looking better than we found them. Um, I have to find your call light. Where is your call light? Okay, well, we're going to put the call light right there in your hand. Environment is clean. I'm going to open the curtains. Wash my hands. If I need a document, I would document and then wash again. And that's the closing. So the opening is done before every skill. The closing is done at the end of every skill. You're going to see this about a million times over the next three and a half weeks. I want you to have a passing awareness of it. You should practice this at home in your bathroom. You have a door to knock on. You've got a curtain that you can pull, the shower curtain. You got somebody to talk to, the one in the mirror. And you've got a sink right there that will let you wash your hands. Okay. So the best place to practice this truly is in your bathroom at home. So you probably want to practice the opening and closing sometime this week just to get familiar with it. When you're um, in here practicing for the skills, if you don't have the opening and the closing down, when we start practicing skills, it's gonna kind of trip you up. You're gonna spend all your time focusing on the opening and the closing rather than the skill itself. So it's, it's best to learn this before we integrate another skill, good? All right, so now I'm gonna show you hand washing. This is in your skills book. Uh, hand washing is in your white skills book on page 30, our step-by-step -step instructions. I'm gonna go over here. Okay, so when you're washing hands, okay, I am not there. <laughs> it's strange. All right, well, we'll have to do it this way then. That's funny. Must have defaulted to a picture. Okay. So when you're washing your hands, the faucet is dirty. Your hands are dirty. It's perfectly okay. Um, you can touch the faucet to turn the faucet on. There's no problem with that. A lot of people get kind of hung up on that. Um, but you want the water to be comfortable. Don't try to get it warm enough or hot enough to kill germs. That would be boiling. You can't wash your hands with boiling water. So comfortable is what we're looking for here. So I'm gonna turn the faucet on, get some water. I'm gonna wet my hands because you need to wet your hands before you put soap on. That way the soap spreads evenly. And you're gonna get a lot of soap. You're graded on bubbles. I am not kidding. You are graded on bubbles. You're gonna bring your hands together and you're gonna look at the clock right above the sink. And you're gonna start rubbing. You wanna rub the tops of your hands by your wrist, the backs of your hands in between your fingers, in between the thumb and index finger, 
both sides and the bottom of your hand by your pinky. Then the palm of your hand interlacing. You wanna keep your hands lower than your elbows. So everything runs down. And you wanna rub for at least 20 seconds. That's just rubbing. So all those areas I talked about, at least 20 seconds. Once you've rubbed for at least 20 seconds, you're gonna take your thumb and go down each one of your nails to clean your cuticles. And then you'll circle your nails on the palm of your hand to clean underneath, and then you'll rinse. When you rinse, you can't touch the inside of the sink or the faucet. And then you're gonna to tap to keep the water in the sink. See how the water is going in the sink? If I do this, where's the water go? We're gonna talk about that in a minute. So tap to keep the water in the sink. Get some paper towels, whatever you need for your hands. If you need two, take two. If you need 10, take 10. Nobody's counting, nobody cares. But you only want to dry what's clean. If I go up here, that's not clean. And then I'm gonna transfer those germs back down here. So you only want to dry what's clean. We'll throw this away, get a clean dry paper towel to turn the faucet off. So we want a clean dry paper towel to turn the faucet off because wet paper towels tend to rip. And the faucet is the dirtiest thing in the bathroom because we touch it with dirty hands all the time. So you wanna make sure that you have a clean dry paper towel to turn that faucet off. You can inspect it easily. It's less likely to rip. But let's talk about this. This is a hard habit to get into. We're all used to doing this or this, right? But what that does is it spreads water around the environment. Pathogens, which are all the bad guys, viruses, bacteria, yeast, fungi, all the bad guys. Pathogens need three things to thrive in, in, in an environment, most pathogens. It's warm, dark, moist. Bathrooms are usually two to three degrees warmer than other, because we don't like to be chilled when we get a shower. They're usually dark because mom trained you, turn the, faucet, or turn the light off when you leave. And we know bacteria live there. We drop them off every day right? So bacteria live in the bathroom. So when you have little pockets of moisture from flicking your hands or shaking, what that does is allows that bacteria that's in the bathroom to proliferate in those pools of water because you need that moisture. And then you walk through there. Now, where are you taking all of that, all of those pathogens? Everywhere. Everywhere throughout the facility, but even Tables. scarier home with you. So we don't want a lot of pathogens in our environment. By doing this, we're limiting our moist area to something we can control. Okay. Does that make sense? Now I have a video on this. Um, I do have a video on this on my main website. So for your CNA.com, it's the number four, Y-O-U-R-C-N-A.com. You've got it on the paper that I gave you. It's also right here. It's also at the bottom of your syllabus. And it will be in the email that you're going to get later today. <laughs> so if you go onto my for your CNA.com website under skills videos, you can see the video for hand washing and it'll walk you through it. It's that top down view that I was trying to get with my camera. For some reason, my camera's not working. All right, so any questions on that? How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. What do we do if we can't follow the care plan? Tell the nurse, okay. Are we allowed to change the care plan? All right. So every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock. Yep, knock. <laughs> yeah, because we have to identify our patient, tell them who and what we are, and get consent before we do the hand washing. So we got a lot of steps in there. 
And then at the end of every skill, we're going to do the closing. Every skill must end with, yep, hand washing, very last thing that we do. And we can make corrections along the way if we want to before we say our skill is done. But once we've said it, no more. Can't go back. Good. Any questions? Okay, so your homework tonight to recap is you're going to read chapter one in the blue book. You're going to take the test on page 132 in the white book and grade it. And if you have any questions as you're reading, write them down for me. Bring them to class with you and I'll be happy to go over them with you. You're going to get two emails from me this afternoon or tomorrow, one or the other, I'm not sure. Um, those two emails, one of them is going to be a recap with links to everything that we talked about including the videos for hand washing and, and um, opening and closing. And then um, the second email is going to be an invitation to the online course. When you click the link in the invitation, it's going to take you to my course. And it, you're going to have to create a, a, a uh, user account. That user, when you create that account, it's gonna have you put in an email address. That email address has to be the same email address that I sent the invitation to. Super important. So if you have two email addresses, make sure you're using the one that I have on file. Otherwise, it's not going to give you access to the online course. Okay, good. Any questions? Did I go too fast for anyone? Are you lost? Is everybody coming back? <laughs> I hope so. All right. Um, on Wednesday, you'll need to bring your blood pressure, or I'm sorry, it's Monday. Next Monday, you're gonna bring your blood pressure cuff and stethoscope to class. You don't need it on Wednesday. Um, but on Wednesday, we're going to learn about gloves and glove removal. So it's gonna be a very, very, very important class. If you can't make it, please make sure that you're tuning in online. All right, good. All right, have a good day. I will see you on Wednesday.